בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה. ברוכים הבאים, everybody. Um, we're uh, back here Wednesday night doing our stamped the rabbi uh, shiur. This is a time for each one of you to ask your questions. Uh, it's even more interactive than ever simply because now we're doing it with uh, all of you online, online followers, online tzedikim that uh, watch us all the time and always ask me, when can you ask a question? This is your time. Ask your questions. This other Shem will... Uh, have a Kadosh Baruch Hu, uh, help us, give us answers, Bezot Hashem. Today's Shiu will be for a uh, Refua Shlema for uh, Sarah Bat Sausan, uh, Rav Ephraim Ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Sarah Bat Anat, Rabbanit Levana Bat Sarah, Sarah Bat Levana, Aurit <coughs> um, Bat Ilana, Batya Bat Sarah, Serach Bat Batya, Michal Bat Yael, Talia Bat Sarah, Itro Ben Avraham, Stefan Ben Katarina, Talia Bat Sarah, Itro Ben Avraham, Oshri Ben Doris, and Leavdil Ilui Nishmat, Bela Meira Bat Rachel. And for Atzlacha uh, Rabba of uh, Oshri Ben Doris, Gabi Ben Doris, Elad Ben Doris, Shaul Ben Farzane, Itro Ben Avraham, and all of uh, Marsha but uh, Julie, and Ayla but Marsha, and all of the wonderful people that continue to support us through resources, whether it be money, time, expertise, Baruch Hashem, fantastic, uh, fantastic people. Uh, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu created in the world and connected us with them. So, we have a Baruch Hashem HaShiu, we have uh, Parashat Vayetze, Vayetze Yaakov Be'er Sheva Vayelech Harana. Uh, we have a uh, sweet parasha with a lot of uh, interesting things, but uh, really the thing is, is that many times we start talking and uh, we don't get enough time to answer a lot of the questions. So, everybody... Uh, send your questions to the thread on the Facebook. Send your questions to the thread on the Facebook. Send them away. The only thing that I ask you is that the question have, you know, uh, be appropriate and have enough kamina, meaning that it's a meaningful question and not just a, uh, uh, you know, something uh, that's not necessarily meaningful. Uh, I don't, you know, I'm assuming you understand what I mean. But uh, otherwise, send, send the question. A few things while you guys are preparing your questions. While you guys are preparing your questions, we'll talk a little bit about uh, a couple small things uh, that uh, are really big things that uh, we need to talk about at this time. Uh, first off, uh, even though Baruch Hashem, we have a lot of people that uh, have downloaded our Bezat Hashem app, it's still nowhere near as much as people that are subscribed to our other channels, our uh, uh, YouTube channels, our uh, Facebook page, and so on. Again, I highly, highly recommend that each one of you uh, sign up and uh, download, if you have a smartphone, which I'm assuming you do, uh, download the uh, Bezat Hashem app. It's a kosher app. There's no commercials. There's no distractions. I even put the Bezat Hashem um, link for the app on the uh, Facebook thread. For anyone that just goes to the first comment, uh, it's simply... Uh, bezratashem.org slash get app bezratashem.org slash get app bezratashem is spelled with two e's so b-e-e-z-r-a-t h-a-s-h-e-m dot org forward slash g-e-t-a-p-p get app and the reason why we're pushing this even more now than ever is uh, simply because of all of the different stories uh, that, that we get from, uh, unfortunately, from uh, different people about how people are falling. They're falling, they're falling, they start doing tshuva, they start watching shiurim, they start doing good things. And uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the problem is, is that there are certain uh, sins that uh, they're falling to on a regular basis. One of the most common uh, is wasting time. Wasting time. Wasting time may not seem like such a big sin, but it is, especially for someone that's already 
a learned individual. It's called, it's called Bitul Torah. Bitul Torah, it's in essence like you're um, canceling out the Torah. Instead of using your time to learn Torah, you're using it to watch nonsense, to do stupid things, to, uh, to watch movies or, or, or all types of other things. And unfortunately, the internet and the televisions in the world today are full of them to no end. There's literally 24 hours a day programming. And uh, many times people that are on the internet or, or watch us on uh, Roku or watch us on all these other different wonderful things that uh, Kadosh Baruch gave us to use to reach people, uh, they start uh, sometimes veering off and looking at other things, end up, uh, you know, stopping their shiur or even right after a shiur, they end up, you know, burning a half hour, an hour, two hours watching things that are just really not going to help them in their life. So the app gives you the, uh, you know, sniper focus that you need to learn a shiur Torah appropriately. Many times people watch the shiur Torah like they're watching a movie, like it's uh, almost like a superficial learning. And uh, that's why it's no wonder where this, you have sometimes people, they can watch shiur Torah for 20 years and nothing changes. Because that's not the way you're supposed to watch a shiur Torah. Shiur Torah is supposed to watch it whether it's live or it's a, a recording. You're supposed to watch it with a notebook and you got to take some notes of different things that you uh, want to remember. You got to study it, not just watch it. And I tell this to my students all the time. Study the shiurim. I myself, to this day, when I learn with Rabbi Ephraim, I end up, after we learn live together, I end up watching the shiurim many times, almost all the time I watch them at least once or twice more, uh, it's, if it's depending on a shiur, simply because I want to study it, I want to remember it, I want to write down some notes, I want to go over certain things. It's very, very important to uh, to study the shiurim because then you're going to be able to apply it to your life, then you're going to be able to remember it and not you know, be a person that's watching shiurim Torah for five, ten years and still have the same knowledge. Nothing has changed. And uh, so it's the distractions that people have on the internet and everywhere else and sometimes even in the comments you know I, I know that you guys enjoy the live feed where you watch the show live you feel like you're here and that's wonderful but sometimes you know I've had to make comments to uh, to tell you guys to stop doing the comments between each other where sometimes people will have a whole full-blown conversation while the shear is going which is not only bad for them but also distracting for other people you know when you watch the show Torah you have to, in essence, feel as if, number one, the, the speaker is right in front of you. And, of course, you wouldn't be having a conversation in front of them uh, if you're a polite person. And second of all, HaKadosh Baruch Hu even more. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is there also. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is watching. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu is not happy if a person is more interested in somebody else's shoe size and somebody else's uh, you know hobbies and somebody else's crazy thoughts and somebody else's heresy while there's a shield to our going. So the beautiful part about the app is that the app eliminates all of those distractions because all you have in front of you is the app. And you listen to the you listen to the Shiur Torah. Now, of course, throughout the day, sometimes you get busy, you got stuff to do. No problem. You can close the app and still listen to the Shiur Torah. It automatically converts it to, uh, to audio. A lot of wonderful things to be done in that app. I can't emphasize it enough. We, we have an app. You go to the app store. It's called Be'ezrat Hashem. And you'll be able to see it there. And now also when you type in Bezot Hashem, you'll also find our other new app, Baruch Hashem, that uh, we have for our dear Rav Mizrahi, Rav Yosef Mizrahi. His app is now officially launched. Baruch Hashem, uh, quite a few people have already signed up and many more people are signing up. So these are two apps that are pretty much you have the Torah in your pocket. You could watch Torah without any distractions. I highly recommend everybody watch the Shulim on there. You have the ability to watch it in regular speed, double speed, one and a half. You could donate there. You could ask questions there. Uh, you could do a lot of wonderful things there. And most importantly, you could focus on the Torah itself. So with that being said, uh, the uh, the other thing that I wanted to talk about, which even though we've discussed it in, in the past years, it's a uh, it seems like a uh, something that we have to continue repeating. Uh, because either people have not heard us say it, or they just didn't get the point yet. So tomorrow, according to the Goim, uh, there is a uh, holiday called Thanksgiving. And Thanksgiving, you know, although the uh, the Goim will tell you that, uh, or the Jews actually will tell you, no, this is not a religious holiday. We're just, uh, you know, th- you know, being thankful and so on. So Alakha is this: 
the Rav Moshe Feinstein, Alav Shalom, which is the biggest Rav that America ever had, and one of the biggest Rabbanim in history. Okay, so should you understand who we're talking about? We're talking about Rav Moshe Feinstein, is Igrot Moshe, this is Kodesh Kodeshim. American Judaism, and quite frankly, Anglo-Saxon, Anglo-Saxon Judaism, pretty much is dependent on him. You have him, you have Rav Aaron Kotlel, uh, you, uh, you, you know, these, these are your, your foundations. These are yeah, the closer of Rebbe. He also was one of the Gedolim. But as far as Alachot, as far as what everybody is, the, the Shulchan Aruch, if you will, the Shulchan Aruch, the modern day Shulchan Aruch, if you will, uh, is the, you know, is, is uh, Ramosha Feinstein. Of course, you also have Chapitz Chaim. But the point being is that you have a situation where you have one of the Gedolim, one of the biggest rabbis that, uh, uh, that, that ever walked on a surface you know, in America, telling us that if this Thanksgiving, if this Thanksgiving is something you did once in your, as a Jew, obviously, as a as a non-Jew, you could do whatever you want. You know, as far as the Thanksgiving, it's a uh, it's it's not necessarily recommended uh, even for non-Jews because it's quite frankly an ugly holiday. They're celebrating the massacre of countless American Indians, so it's an ugly holiday. But for more details on that, you can watch my shield that I have uh, made in uh, last year. Uh, it's called uh, uh, Thanksgiving Uncensored or something like that. Um, or Uncensored Truth About Thanksgiving. Either way, you go to my channel, you, th- you type in uh, Thanksgiving and you'll see the whole shield or half hour shield about it. But Ramos Feinstein says clearly, as a Jew, if you did it, one time in your life, with your fellow Jews, with your family, with your friends, whatever it is, um, that's one thing. There's an etel for that. There's a leniency for that. But to celebrate it, to celebrate it every year on the same day is a sul Torah. It's forbidden by the Torah. Why? Because number one, you're making it a chok kavua. You're making it a permanent law. You're making it a permanent law where it's becoming something that you do every year on a regular basis on the same day. Lehavdi, like Yom Kippur, like Rosh Hashanah, like Hanukkah. Every year they're always on the same day. You know, a Pesach, every year is on the same day. So to celebrate anything that's outside of the Torah, outside of what our sages instituted, as a, as a day that you do anything is forbidden. To have, you know, now you could say no, but it's not a, it's not a religious holiday. We're just being thankful. Well, you should think twice about that. Number one, Rav Vigdo Milo, Alava Shalom, says that if you look at some of the older encyclopedias where some of the kosher Jews, uh, the kosher uh, Gentiles, speak about this holiday, they say that it is indeed a religious holiday for them. So the foundation of this Thanksgiving is a religious holiday. So, and he actually, Rav Vigdo Miller says that he thinks that, aside from the fact that it's forbidden to do this holiday, he thinks that anyone that eats turkey on this day is, is connected to Avodah Zarah. It's connected to idolatry. It's to that extent. It's to that extent. This Rav Vigdo Miller, you can't say, oh no, I don't think he knows what he's talking about. This is one of the Gdolim of America. Uh, and so now, he's basing this on what Rav Moshe Feinstein said. Rav Moshe Feinstein said, if you did it one time in your life, it's one thing. But to go and celebrate Thanksgiving on an annual basis every year, uh, you know, at the same day, and you're eating uh, the, the same food as the goyim, you're eating the turkey and all that stuff, and, you know, it, it's forbidden. It's forbidden for a Jew to do it. Because you're adding a holiday to the Torah. Worse yet, worse yet, what makes this even something that we have to keep repeating every year and not just republicize the same shoe is that I personally believe that it's pretty clear for anyone with eyes and ears and a little bit of knowledge in the Torah that Jews celebrating Thanksgiving actually brings a lot of deen, a lot of judgment to the world. And I'll tell you why. When we tell people, listen, Shabbat is coming. Shabbat, Kodesh, 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 Shabbat is coming. Many times, many times, people say, oh, yeah, yeah, Shabbat, you know, Shabbat. Like, they don't understand what's the big deal of Shabbat. It's like, oh, yeah, it's every week, it's every week. What's the big deal of Shabbat? They don't look at it as uh, the way they should, even if they're religious. They don't necessarily always look at it the way they should. Many do, but not enough. 
Better yet, we say, oh, the holidays are coming. Pesach is coming. Sometimes you'll see half the people, if not more, say, oof, wow, Pesach, oh man, I don't like this, I don't like this, I can't believe I have to prepare for this, I can't believe I have to do this, now we have to clean, now we have to eat matzah, now we have to do this, and people start complaining about the, about the holiday that the Kadosh Baruch Hu gave us as a gift. They'd say, oh, Yom Kippur is coming, oh, I'm so hungry, what, what, it hasn't started yet, you're already hungry? And they start complaining about the holiday, say, you know, most of the time we talk about Jewish holidays and people complain about them. Sometimes they're disappointed they're coming or they feel anxiety that they're coming. But yet when it comes to Thanksgiving, no one feels anxiety. No one feels pressure. No one dislikes it. And I believe that this brings judgment to the Jewish people because his, his holidays, his gifts that he gave us, we treat them as if they're like eh, used products. But the product of the goyim, we are we're celebrating. And many times people act as if they have a lot more fun during this Thanksgiving than they do on Rosh Hashanah or on Yom Kippur or even on Tisha B'Av. They act like as if it's better. And it's there's a verse in the Torah that HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to Jeremiah. He says that they, they left me, the wellspring of, of pure water, and replaced me with a broken cistern. Broken cisterns places where there's little tiny little puddles of whatever is left over instead of the Mayim Chaim the living water that's endless from Hashem we replace them with little puddles that we find in the streets that's in essence when we replace the holiness and the Kedusha of Shabbat and the celebration of our holidays that Hashem gave us whether it be Hanukkah or it be Purim or it be even a, uh, Yom Kippur as the Gemara in Masechet Tanit says, there's no better day for the Jewish people like Yom Kippur. Even though you're fasting and even though it seems like it's bad, it's one of the greatest days for the Jewish people because that's the day that Hashem cleans us up. If you're not excited about Yom Kippur, but you're excited about Thanksgiving, I promise you, this does not look good on your report card. It does not look good on your report card with Hashem. Because you're replacing Maim Chaim, you're replacing the, the, uh, the sweet, endless, pure water of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, with a broken sister so this thanksgiving rabotai i know that you know some of you are already used to it and you feel like maybe you're gonna offend some people i promise you it's much better to offend people than to offend hashem much better it's better that you offend people by following hashem than offend hashem by following people and you have to simply just give it up don't show up to these events don't show up not even for a second now, goyim, on the other hand, you know, that are you know not idol worshippers, but uh, righteous goyim that want to celebrate this holiday. Again, I think it's an ugly holiday. I think anyone that knows about the holiday thinks it's an ugly holiday. Uh, but even if you say, no, no, we're not really celebrating it uh, for what it's really about. We're just using this as an opportunity to get the, together with family. Yes, you have a uh, you know you have a permission to do it, but uh, I personally would recommend choose a different day. Choose a different day. Don't do it on that day. Every year, use a, you know, do a different day. Instead of the 25th, do it 24th. Do it 26th. Do it 29th. Do it on the 1st. Do it any other day. You don't have to necessarily do it the same day that all of this tum'ah, all of this impurity is coming to the world. You know, so it's not a good day in the world, needless to say, for Am Yisrael and for anyone that's following Torah. So it's, uh, I highly, highly recommend that people forsake this holiday and simply abandon it and just stick to our holy Torah. Go and use that time and resources and money and happiness to prepare for Shabbat, which is only 48 hours away. You know, go prepare for Shabbat. Go prepare for something good. Stop wasting your time eating a bunch of turkey on a day that a bunch of people died. It's not It's not a nice thing to do. It really is not a nice thing to do. It's like saying, you know, let's, uh, let's uh, celebrate uh, the day that your mom died. Let's celebrate the day that your uh, wife died, your cousin died, you're this, who wants to do that? It's not nice. So that's the thing. You have to look at it from other people's perspective also. Even though you don't know them and, and so on, it's just not a good day. For Jews, it's 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 a horrible thing. As Rav Avigdor Miller says, it's uh, at least avak of, of, of Abu Dazara. At least it's the dust of Abu Dazara, if not Abu Dazara Mamash. Rav Moshe Feinstein said it's completely forbidden. Now, I'm sure that some of you are going to find some rabbi, big or small, say, no, it's a nice day, it's a nice day. Listen, the way we go with Psak is we go with the Gdolei Ado. We go with the biggest of the, and the best. That's who we go by. 
we don't go with someone else that said something. We go with who's the biggest, who is the one that Klal Israel, Klal Israel followed. Now, if you are Ashkenazi, you're Sfaradi, you're this, you have your Gadol. Everybody's got their Gadol, their, their, their giant sage. If your giant sage, if your holy sage said something different, that's one thing. But I highly doubt he did. Why? Because again, it, it's clear, it's clear that this is not something that's good for us. It's not something that's good for us. Uh, we have enough, enough judgment in the world already today. Uh, there's no need to bring more. Uh, you know, you see simply that, uh, you know, judgment is such a scary thing that even the, the biggest tzaddikim in history was scared of it. Even the biggest tzaddikim in history was scared of it. I mean, just look at the whole issue with, you know, the, there was a question that was asked, uh, you know, earlier today. Someone asked, how come... How come a, uh, a uh, Avraham and Yitzchak both used the same tactic to deal with Avimelech when they went to his country and uh, they pretended as if their wives were really their sisters? Didn't they have emuna? It has nothing to do with not having emuna. It has nothing to do with it. So why did Avraham lie? Why did Avraham? It didn't te- te- technically wasn't a lie, but even if you want to say that it wasn't exactly 100% true, why did Avraham do it? Why did Avraham say that Sarah? Is a sister. Why did his son Yitzchak do the same thing? Why did he say? Why did they say that their wives are their sisters and not their wives? Now the pasuk itself says the pasuk, the verse over there says, Abraham says to Avimelech, I told you that she was my sister because I was afraid that since I saw that there was no yirat shemaim here, there's no fear of heaven here. You nobody's afraid of God here. They'll kill me once they find out she's my sister. And the same, and, and the the Chazal says the uh, Onkelos Onkelos says that uh, Itzhak Avinu just followed the footsteps of his father. He knew the story. He knew what what his father did when a situation presented itself, and he followed the footsteps of his father. Is there better footsteps than Avraham Avinu? So he followed it. So does that have to do with them not having emuna? No. First and foremost, there is no reason to put yourself in danger. There's no reason to put yourself in danger. If you see that there's a bunch of crazy people that are not afraid of God, that are, are surrounding you, there's no reason for you to just say, oh yeah, I'm a, I'm a Jew. There's no reason for you to do that. There's no reason for you to scream that oh, you're a Jew uh, surrounded by a bunch of people that are Nazis. There's simply no reason for it. Why are you putting yourself in danger? You could just simply do what we talked about last night in the Shiul, Ikvita de Meshicha, the era of Mashiach by Rav uh, Wasserman, which is... You're, pre- you're at clear danger over there. They're stronger than you. What do you do? Run away. Go away. That's what you got to do. In this case, Avram could not run away. What other option did he have? His option was to just simply lie about it and just pray to Hashem that he takes him out of this situation. And it's this is what the Torah wants. The Torah does not want you to put yourself in a situation where, in essence, you're forcing God's hand to give you a miracle because you put yourself in danger. We're not allowed to do such things. So it's very important to know that this is the Avot, the Avot HaKtoshim, at the highest level of connection to Hashem, but yet they themselves knew that if you're surrounded by danger, there's a way to deal with it and a strategy. What's the strategy? Run away from it. Don't, don't face it face to face. There's no reason for that. If Hashem wants to deal with it, He'll deal with it on His terms, not the ones that you give Him. The second thing is, Rabotai, is that Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, David Melech, Moshe Rabbeinu, all of the righteous people that we have mentioned in our Torah, they weren't so confident about their own merit account. Avraham says that he's a uh, dust and ashes. Moshe Rabbeinu says, uh, We're nothing, not even dust and ashes, we're absolutely nothing. David Melech says, You know, Ani Tolat Velo Ish. Yaakov Avinu says, Katonti Mikola Chasadim. David Amelech says, He's a worm and not a person. A, uh, 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 Yaakov Avinu is saying that uh, he's, a, he's already all the merits and the good and the, and, and the blessings that Hashem gave him is already more than he deserves. So it's not that there were some self conscious losers or something like that, Chas Shalom, but rather they weren't so confident about their merits. Why? Because they saw that everything that Hashem gave them is a blessing whether it's viewed as good or bad by the people doesn't make a difference everything he's given them is a blessing and maybe all of these blessings are already more, they see it's already more than perhaps what they deserve 
So to put themselves in a situation where they have to spend, if you will, those blessings to get themselves saved out of a situation is not a good idea. And a person needs to understand that HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't owe us anything. He doesn't owe us anything. He is the king. We owe him everything. So to go out there and uh, put ourselves in a situation where we think, oh no, you know what, I'm going to celebrate Chas Shalom this, this Thanksgiving, and uh, but because I do enough mitzvot, because I, I, I do a daf yomi, and uh, I go to a shiur, and I give tzedakah, so Hashem is going to forgive me for this Thanksgiving. Don't be so sure of your merits to say that you could just freely make sins, especially when it's going against the Chachamim. Chachamim said, don't do it. Chachamim said, don't do it. You're going to go up to Shamaim, you're going to see one of these Chachamim that you went against as the Dayan for your deen. For your deen, he's going to be the head judge for your, for your Olam Abba. He's going to decide. He's going to decide whether you have Olam Abba or not. Is a person, is a person really that confident for themselves to put themselves in a situation like that? No one should ever be that confident. You know, so the key is to understand. There are certain things that Torah says you have to stay away from. You have to stay away from. This is one of those things that you have to stay away from. It's a, it's not for Jewish people. And again, it's a, uh, if you want to eat turkey, eat it on a different day. You can eat it the day before, a day after, a week after. You can eat it every single day. Just don't do it that day. Why? Because once you do it that day, you connect to the tuma, to the klipa that is from that day. And that's not something that you want in your life. It's simply not. So with that being said, hopefully you guys have some questions. Let's see what you guys have. Send questions. Okay, I think you got it. You're sending a question. It's asking where to send questions. It's kind of funny. Okay, dear Rabbi, uh, David Tseng is asking this. What is the best book to read for one to fix and refine their character traits? What advice does the Torah give for overcoming the flaw of laziness? Okay, so the people ask this question very often. What is the best book to read? The truth be told, there is no best book. And the reason why, as you see from, you know, the library behind me, the library on the side you can not see, this one library over here, and the library outside, Baruch Hashem, our Torah is endless. What I have is not even 1% of 1% of 1% of what's available out there. You could have literally uh, buildings full of books about our Torah, and it's still not a fraction of what our Torah is. Uh, you know, so it's a, our Torah is endless. And in essence, every single part is a little different from the other or a lot different from the other because it's a process. Learning the Torah is a process where you exert effort to learn it, to toil over it, to support it in every way you possibly can, to, to, to make sacrifices for it. And then eventually Hashem gifts it to you. He gifts it to you. You don't become... A Talmit Chacham because you have a special brain. You become a Talmit Chacham because you're trying to learn Torah and eventually Hashem sees that you're trying and then He gives it to you. This is what the Midrash says about Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu was in Mount Sinai, 40 days, 40 nights. At the end of the 40 days and 40 nights of studying one-on-one with HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself, he says to Hashem, I forgot everything. I forgot everything. What am I going to do? Hashem says, now I'm going to gift it to you. Because I saw that you exerted yourself 40 days, 40 nights. You didn't eat, you didn't sleep. I saw. You forgot everything we learned. He gave it to him like he gave him like a little a little uh, USB inside his head. Choop, everything everything in the Torah inserted in there. He knew the entire Torah. He actually knew more than what we have in the world today. Because he actually had the entire Torah, whereas we have the essence of Torah. The point is, is that the Torah itself is enormous. So there is no best book for any one particular thing, but it's a culmination of books. So there are recommended books uh, for these, which I'll mention a few. Uh, but again, one is not necessarily always better for, than the other because sometimes this book is best for one person at a different stage of his life than another. 
So some of the books that are very, uh, you know, famous, well-known books, you have the Chovot Levavot, written almost a thousand years ago, Rabbeinu uh, Bechaye, is a very in-depth book. It's, uh, in, if you're getting the English one, English version, I think it's two volumes, um, very deep insights about character traits, character development, bitachon, all of the tools that a person needs to have. I mean, if you read this book a thousand times, it still wouldn't be enough. Not because it's that hard, but just because each time you're fold, you're unfolding another layer of the onion, another you're peeling another layer of the onion. You'll learn more the second time and the third time. But you shouldn't necessarily read just that one book. Why? Because we have many others. You also have Kava Yashal. Kava Yashal from a few hundred years ago. This is uh, also two volume if you're reading it in English. Kava Yashal is, has uh, just enormous pearls and diamonds in it, one after another, one after another. You never get enough. Each one about character development. Then you have mes- the famous Mesilat Yasharim, or in English, Path of the Just, the Ramchal. The Ramchal, Rabbi Moshe Chaim Luzato, Kodesh Kodeshim. Many say that he wrote this book with Ruach HaKodesh. The, the Gaomi Vilna says that if he was alive, if, if, the, if the Ramchal was alive, he would crawl to go see him. He would crawl across the across the world just to go see him. That's how holy he uh, he, uh, he viewed his book, the Mesilat Yesharim as. So this book uh, is a fantastic book. There's actually a very good series by our dear Rav uh, Yosef Mizrahi that he made about it many years ago, which is still extremely popular and relevant. Highly recommend that uh, it's called Path of the Just series, and you could actually see it on his app, uh, on his new app. Uh, so uh, this Mesiyat uh, Sharim or Path of the Just, he goes into sections, you know, two dozen sections, two dozen sections about, you know, each part of your servitude of Hashem by developing a character trait, by being zealous, by being speedy to your to your uh, to do mitzvot, overcoming la- laziness. You know, becoming uh, more clean, not just physically, but spiritually clean, and so on and so forth. He has enormous, enormous chidushim. Even the preface, the, the introduction from the author itself needs to be studied in, in detail. That's just the first page where he's writing uh, just the details of what this book is about. That itself is studied by many, many Talmidei Chachamim uh, of how much beauty is in it, how much... Uh, uh, he has uh, uh, the the humility that he has is unbelievable. Where he says, "Listen, I'm not bringing you anything new. You know, I'm just reminding you of what you already know, but perhaps forgot or not taking uh, you know taking into account daily." In reality, almost the entire book is brand new to every person that reads it, even the hundredth time. It's unbelievable, and this is one of the great books. You also have the very famous Sharet Tshuva. Sharet Tshuva. All I can say is this is Rabbeinu Yonah, the, the, the nephew of the Ramban, you know, written about 800 years ago. All I can say is, if you read the Sharet Tshuva, you read the whole Sharet Tshuva, and you don't do Tshuva, you have a certification of the Fuk. The Fuk, you have a certification, you can make yourself a nice postcard, put it right next to your license plate, everything, tell everybody, who am I? The Fuk. What do you mean, why the Fuk? The Fuk is simply, a, uh, uh, you're, you're, uh, you're uh, stuck. You're uh, just uh, someone that cannot grow, you're just somebody that cannot move. There's a, uh, it's almost like all of the uh, openings in your body are now closed. It's, why? That book... Is, is just one of those books where you read it, every every single sentence is life, just life altering. Every sentence, not every paragraph, every, every, every sentence is life altering, if you understand what he's saying. He scares the living lights out of you, first of all, right off the bat and throughout the whole book. On top of that, he tells you about things you didn't even think were sins, and he tells you how big of a sins they are, and he gives you countless sources. So, I mean, this Shalei Tshuva, it's perhaps one of the, you know, the, the greatest books ever written in the world. Uh, and needless to say, to, to help do Tshuva, to overcome, uh, you know, flawed character traits that we all have. Then you have some things that are more, more, more recent. Of course, you have Rav Mizrahi's book, a very good book, or, you know, a compilation of many of his uh, lectures that he's given over the years in book format. Then you have 
Uh, one of my personal favorites, you have a uh, uh, Rav Nisim Yagen. Rav Nisim Yagen, he has a whole series of books uh, that were recently translated to English uh, that are just uh, Kodesh Kodeshim. Netive Or is one of the, uh, is the main book, but then there's many others. Netive Or is uh, just a book that every paragraph is like a lightning hitting your, your heart to, to wake you up. Uh, and uh, this is uh, hard to find. These English books by Rav Nisim again are hard to find. Uh, they quickly sell out and they don't stock anywhere quick enough. Be'ezot uh, Hashem, this is uh, one of the most important books in English and I highly recommend people uh, get them if you can get a whole set. We're in a uh, you know, uh, process of, of, of trying to get some uh, so we could uh, give people an opportunity to get them. But uh, the point is, is that it's a, uh, if you have access to it, get it. Whatever he has in English, if you're an English speaker, whatever he has in English, buy it. Uh, it they're all fantastic books. Each one of them has beautiful, beautiful insights by one of the recent Gdolim, Rav Nisim Yagen, Allah Shalom. Then you have a uh, Or Israel. Or Israel is by uh, Rabbi Israel Misalant and is uh, Tamid Muvak Rav Blazer. Uh, this is a book of letters by uh, Rabbi Yisraeli Salant, where each one of the letters you pretty much have to read. Not that you should read, you have to read at least four, five, six times just to get a gist of what he's saying because it's so deep philosophically. It's so deep that he literally rewires your neshama as you're reading it. It's a beautiful, beautiful work, unbelievable. Rabbi Yisraeli Salant, of course, is one of the heads of the uh, Musar movement and uh, one of the biggest Rabbanim that we've had in the last several hundred years. Uh, his Talmidim, his Talmidim were angels among men. Needless to say, he himself. Uh, so you have uh, you have that book. And uh, you have a, also the Igeret Agra, the Igeret Ramban. Uh, these are the short letters of the Chachamim from... Uh, the previous generations that uh, we have a whole series about Igeret Aramban uh, of almost 30 lectures going over this one letter with something around 100 hours, 100 hours of lectures just about this one letter. That's how much you can study from it and we didn't even scratch the surface. There's a lot more you can study about it. So that book, of course, with commentary, same thing with the Igeret Agra. This is the uh, letter by the uh, Gaumi Vilna. Uh, to his family before he uh, left uh, to go to Eretz Yisrael. Uh, many of the letters of the Chachamim are studied by other Chachamim because there's so much wisdom in them. The point being is that you got to pick one, you got to pick one, study it thoroughly, move on to the next one, study it thoroughly, move on to the next one, and little by little, do the best you can to apply as much as you can. And each time it's going to perfect your neshama. Next question. Where can someone who is sick, disabled, hospitalized learn halacha regarding their duties? Also, if you're in a hospital and can't eat kosher, is it still a sin? Okay. So, as far as someone that's hospitalized um, and, uh, you know, to, to, to learn halacha, I mean, you have a, uh, that all depends if this person is able to read. If he's able to read, then he should get himself a book. Uh, you can get the uh, Fis Faradi, get himself a Yakut Yosef, one of the volumes. You can put him on top of the bed over there. They usually have the, uh, I spent a lot of time in hospital, so I know this uh, part. They all have these uh, tables that you put your food on. Instead of putting the food on, you put a uh, book on there. And you can read uh, the uh, an entire volume of uh, Yakut Yosef every week because you have so much time on your hands. And it's not a shame. You don't have to spend time in a hospital, but if you're already there, Get yourself a Yakut Yosef if you're a Sfaradi. If you're a uh, Ashkenazi, get yourself a Mishnah Brura. Mishnah Brura, Chafetz Chaim, it's Kodesh Kodeshim. You learn the Alachot from there. And uh, you, uh, you you could read, again, like I said, you could read a lot in a hospital bed. Get yourself a book. That's the best place. Now, if you don't have the ability to get the book, you don't have the ability to get the book, and uh, because uh, you know, for one reason or another, either it's money or there's no room, whatever the case is. Today, Baruch Hashem, Kadosh Baruch Hu blessed us where there's a lot of the stuff is available online. You go to artscroll.com 
and you have you can get many of their books in digital format they have a whole app on the uh, on the iPad I believe and I'm sure in other things that you can simply buy their books but just digitally and you could just read the book through that and I'm sure you could do it with many other books and other uh, other places on Amazon and on uh, uh, other uh, uh, apps that you could uh, you can go to the Merkava. You can read a lot of things in the Merkava on there. Uh, again, I'm referring to, to English because in Hebrew there's no end to the amount of resources you have. In, in English there's less, but still a lot. There's a lot of halacha that you can read, and I personally recommend for people to start off with the day-to-day halachot, the day-to-day laws what to do, you wake up in the morning, that you let your dime, what do you bless, things like that, and Alachot Shabbat. Those two, you could do a combination of both, are going to help you get at least a very good understanding of your day-to-day responsibilities. Uh, and Shabbat, since Shabbat is the, uh, you know, is the uh, foundation of all of the blessings and so on, uh, it's also, uh, in addition to that, it's also a uh, the foundation of all of the holidays, meaning that Whatever is forbidden on the Shabbat is forbidden on, uh, on the holidays, with a couple of minor exceptions. Uh, so it's a, uh, like cooking is allowed on the holidays if you do fire to fire, but on Shabbat there's no cooking allowed. But as far as all the things that are forbidden on Shabbat and the things that are allowed on Shabbat are allowed on the other holidays, uh, with minor exceptions. So when you learn the laws of Shabbat, you are in essence learning most of the rules for all of the holidays at the same time. So this you can do on uh, uh, digitally. You can get the, uh, if you're Ashkenazi, you can get the Kitsur Shulchan Aruch, the Kitsur Shulchan Aruch, uh, digitally. Uh, I'm sure it doesn't, doesn't cost very much, and they, uh, you could uh, buy it, and you could read it digitally. Now, if you cannot do option one, which is get the actual book, which is always the best option, you can't get the book, and you don't have the ability to get the uh, you know, online version either. You don't have, for whatever reason. What's the next bet? You go and get a video. Video, you go to, uh, uh, you know, the um, internet. You go to, uh, and, and just listen to a uh, uh, lectures that have to do with day-to-day laws. And like I said, you could just type in laws of Shabbat. Laws of Shabbat. And you'll see countless lectures of people talking about the laws of Shabbat. Or you could do laws of uh, blessings. And uh, you will see countless lectures about blessings. And that way, you'll be able to uh, do a lot of uh, learning while you're in a hospital. And to follow up with your second question, if you're in a hospital and you can't eat kosher, is it still a sin? Uh, that's a pretty vague question. And the reason why I say that is, what do you mean you can't eat kosher? You can't eat kosher because it's not available there? Or you can't eat kosher because the hospital or the doctor told you that if you eat kosher... You're going to die. I highly doubt it's the latter. I highly doubt it's the latter. Uh, the reality is that it's most likely the first, that there's no kosher available there. So there are different organizations that uh, actually come to hospitals and bring you kosher and bring you kosher food. Uh, so you just have to make arrangements. In the meantime, try to eat whatever you can that is neutral, that's kosher, whether it's fruits, vegetables, a, uh, um, you know, things that are uh, parv, definitely not meat and chicken. Definitely not meat and chicken. There's no permission for that. Uh, I mean, so you uh, you can't eat that because you're not dying uh, as a result of not eating the meat. Uh, so you can eat other things. You can eat vegetables and things like that. And today, many hospitals are going to be able to uh, meet your needs. I've gone to many hospitals, Baal uh, Hashem. And, uh, you know, at times they had it already ready there. At other times they had to make a few calls, but they got it with this in the same day. So uh, it's a, you know, getting kosher food today is easier than ever. There are literally millions of products that are kosher, whether it be cookies, muffins, uh, uh, all types of uh, candies, all types of uh, microwavable food, and so on and so forth. So there really isn't a reason for you not to eat kosher if you're if you're in a hospital because the hospital will be able to cater to you. Next question. But to answer, by the way, to add one more small thing, 
if let's say for example this is a hypothetical example the Gemara even brings if the doctor tells you eat this uh, if you don't eat this pig you're gonna die you eat the pig because your life is 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 more uh, more important than the than anything else that's not very common but again the point is is that it's a uh, it's only if there's a life risk only if there's a life risk not if there's a convenience or a uh, preference risk there's no such no no permission for that okay next question by ethan at work they're doing yom keshet hashem yishmo v'yatzil hashem yishmo v'yatzil uh, yom keshet the gay rainbow pride day am i allowed to work there even though i don't support it uh yes you are allowed to work there but you should now go to work on that day you should call in sick because in reality you should be sick to your stomach uh but uh don't go to work on that disgusting day uh don't be next to this cheol, this disgust don't be next to those people uh do not take any uh any part of the celebration don't nothing and you have to take off even if they tell you no we can't you have to come in on that morning to, uh, you you uh, you just say listen i'm sorry i can't show up i don't feel well and that's it uh and uh, there's nothing they can do next uh nisim Kodarav, what is the difference between Bediavad and Lechatchila? Oh, very, very good question. Chazaku Baruch Nisim. Okay, so there is a com- constant term uh, where you hear people that speak Allah, uh, which is what he said, Bediavad and Lechatchila. Okay, so now there are certain things in the Torah that are crystal clear, black and white. Black and white, allowed, not allowed, meaning you are not allowed to drive on shabbat you are not allowed to drive on yom kippur unless there's a life risk meaning you're driving to take yourself or somebody else to the hospital to save their life otherwise there's no permission to drive not a car not a golf cart nothing not even uh, not, not allowed to even think about such things it's not allowed doesn't matter if you found some uh, some sticker that says this is a kosher golf cart for Shabbat. Complete nonsense. There is no driving on Shabbat. That is crystal clear. Okay? Now, so there are certain things that are crystal clear. There are certain things, perhaps, that it is a, uh, there is room for error there. Not necessarily room for error, but room for leniency, I should say. Room for leniency. So it's a meaning that if you are uh, going to uh, um, uh, do it, uh, the, the the right way the uh, the best is meaning okay let's rewind there is let's say certain things that you can do in multiple ways there's the perfect way and then there is the okay you did it stick it's fine it's not the preferable way but it's fine so that's in essence what it is so this is usually in places where there is a leniency there's a leniency meaning that there is uh, you're supposed to do this mitzvah this way but if you uh you didn't do it then uh you could still it's still a pass let me think of some a uh, uh some uh, examples okay one example is for uh, a uh when you have rosh chodesh now our days our days start at night our days start at night so you're supposed to say the Yalevi Avo during your prayer. But on the night before, the night of, if you will, actually, of Rosh Chodesh, you're supposed to already start saying, you're supposed to already say, start adding this little paragraph to your prayer. But because it's the night, it's just, or it's the Mincha, really, it's the Mincha before of the Rosh Chodesh. It's not official okay then if you don't do it you don't have to repeat the whole prayer whereas if you forget it the following day in shachrit you forget to do it then you do have to repeat it the whole prayer so let me re re, re uh, reword this okay on rosh chodesh on rosh chodesh which is the first day of the jewish month we jewish people have to add a paragraph to our prayers to our uh, amida prayers and to our birkat amazon okay now the uh this is supposed to be done uh the uh, 
really the mincha before Rosh Chodesh officially begins, and even in Arvit. Okay? But if you don't do it, you miss it. You forgot. You forgot to do it. You don't have to repeat the whole prayer all over again. But if you forget the following day, meaning on the morning prayer, which is the official the official uh, day, the official Rosh Chodesh, you forget there, then you actually have to repeat the whole prayer again. So what is that? Now, that means that Lechatchila, the preferable way, the perfect way to do it, is by saying already the Alevi on, uh, you know, on, during that prayer. That's the Lechatchila. But if you forgot to do it, then you don't have to repeat it because your blessing will pass Bediavad. Meaning, it's after the fact already, there's no need to fix it. There's no need to redo it. That's, in essence, what it is. The lechatchila is the, uh, is the first choice. That's the preferable, that's the best way. But the avad is after fact, meaning that there's no need to correct it. Since you've already done it, this is ex- it's, uh, it's acceptable because there's a leniency here. But this, again, but the avad... In this particular case, with the Yalevi Avo part, with the extra prayer for the uh, for Rosh Chodesh, is only available on the night be, the night of Rosh Chodesh. It's not available on the day of Rosh Chodesh. On the day of Rosh Chodesh, you can only do the Lechatchila. You can only do the Lechatchila, or else you have to repeat the whole prayer all over again. But the night before, because there's a leniency there, there's a because uh, Mincha is not officially. The Rosh Chodesh and Arvit is not a uh, the same biblical obligation like you have a Shachit and Mincha. So because of that, if you forget to do the Rosh Chodesh prayer there, then it passes, you don't have to repeat it. That's Bediavad. I hope I explained it well. But again, in essence, the, the basics of the meaning is, is that Lechatchila is first choice. That's the way you're supposed to do it. But if you didn't do it that way, you did it, uh, you made a mistake, not, you made a mistake and you did it another way, but there is, there is a permission, there's a permission to have a leniency there, then it's called Bediavad. Now, you're not allowed to do Bediavad on purpose, meaning you can't just say, listen, I don't really have to do this extra prayer, really, because if I don't do it, they'll let me go anyway. So you can't just go in on purpose, do Bediavad. But the Avad is, is in essence a permission to make a mistake, not a purposeful mistake. You know, purposeful mistake is not a mistake. Purposeful mistake is a sin. Okay, it's a uh, this is a mistake, but it's still in essence it passes. It passes. So that's the uh, that's the difference between the Avad and lechatchila. Next question by one. What was the purpose in ancient times when reading the Torah uh, for mitugaman? Were there Jews from different parts of the world? Ah, okay. So the uh, the midrash, the I'm sorry, the midrash onkelos, or targum onkelos, it's called, is a. Many people think that uh, myself included at some point that onkelos wrote, onkelos wrote the uh, targum onkelos, but that's actually not true. Uh, the Targum was actually given to us at Mount Sinai, and but then many many years later it was lost, and Onkelos, the convert, brought it back with his kedusha and wisdom that he had. He brought it back to the world, if you will. So now, what is this in essence? This Targum Onkelos. The biggest difference between Targum Onkelos versus, let's say, the commentary by Rashi is that while Rashi gives you details of uh, commentary details him and the Ramban and the Chizkuni and the Midrash Rabbah and all of these other Midrashim while they're giving you a lot of commentary about behind the scenes things that are happening that you're not uh, perhaps reading clearly in the verses that the, the Targum Onkelos is in essence explaining to you literally what's being said here and that's in essence what we got at Mount Sinai because Akadosh Baruch Hu's language, the way he speaks, is not the way people spoke. It's not the way we speak. Even if somebody is a, uh, you know, a, uh, 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 his first language is Hebrew, uh, and even if he not only speaks Hebrew, but he knows Torah, if he's one of the Chachamim, he still doesn't speak like the Torah. 
It doesn't speak the same conversation like the Torah. It doesn't speak Sfata Kodesh because we don't speak that way. It's just not the way that we communicate. So many times a person that uh, that does not know Sfata Kodesh on a high level is not going to understand what is the literal translation, not commentary, but translation of what's being said here. Like what is this actually saying here? Because it's God talking and it's not a human being, meaning that if it's God talking, we can't miss what he's saying. We have to know what he's trying to tell us here. Where if it's a person talking, you know, if you don't want to pay attention, you don't necessarily have to. Uh, it's disrespectful, but nonetheless, it's not, your your life is not on the line like it would be uh, if, uh, if it's God talking. So at Mount Sinai, Moshe Rabbeinu got both the written Torah and the oral Torah. And part of the oral Torah was the Targum, was the Targum, which is, in essence, telling us what's being said here, literally. No commentary background, but rather just literally what the verse means. So in previous generations, and really only until recent history, maybe the last hundred years or so, uh, and there are some traditions like in Morocco that still do it to this day, uh, in Yemen that still do it to this day, uh, where when the uh when the Baal Kore would read the Torah scroll uh in public he would read a verse or a few verses and then stop and then there would be a meturgeman which is somebody else that would tell people what did he just say not because they didn't speak Hebrew not because they didn't speak Svata Kodesh but to make sure that they understood what is actually being said here. Because the language of the Torah is not everyday language, even for the ones that spoke to, uh, Hebrew. It's not everyday language because Hashem uses a uh, clean language. So, for example, uh, many times in the Torah, Hashem uses words that are the opposite, opposite of what they mean, uh, specifically to keep them clean or better yet there is no words to describe the uh, specific uh, things in, uh, in in the world for example the the male member or the female uh, you know sex organ there is no word in the Torah for it there is no Torah there is words that imply it but there is no words in the Torah that are specifically that uh, like in the streets of today, unfortunately, there's 500 descriptions for it. Because people have a filthy mind. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he doesn't have specific words for certain things because he speaks in a clean language. Same thing goes when, it, when he's talking about women and men that are promiscuous. So they, when he says that it's forbidden for a woman to be a promiscuous he doesn't say it's forbidden to for a woman to be a, a, a promiscuous but he says it's forbidden for her to be kdesha now kdesha if you don't know what's the content of that particular verse actually means holy which is the opposite of promiscuous so Chachamim explained to us obviously it's not forbidden to be holy but rather Kadosh Baruch Hu doesn't want to talk about his children in such a way so he's in essence using the opposite of that word the opposite of it same thing is used also in the Gemara many times in the Gemara when it talks about uh, uh, that uh, if Am Yisrael makes certain sins you know they uh, will get uh, uh, punished what is it so uh, it does the opposite it, it learned from Hashem so the Chachamim they say if if uh, Am Yisrael does this then all of their enemies will be destroyed now, of course, if Am Yisrael sins, all of their enemies are not going to be destroyed. But we don't want to write that Am Yisrael is going to be Chas Shalom destroyed. So that's what the Chachamim followed, in essence, the uh, their father in heaven, and used the same format. Used the same format. So the Metur Geman, the translator, is not translating it from, uh, from Hebrew to a, uh, a different language, necessarily, but rather is simply telling you what the verses mean in your day-to-day language. Your day-to-day language. And that was called originally Targum. And then later on, at the time of Onkelos, it was renamed to be Targum Onkelos because he's the one that brought it back to the world. Hazakubo on the question.
uh, Yitzchak, uh, Baruch Hashem, take notes, was about to watch a movie, then saw this, no coincidence. You're right, there is no coincidence. Uh, Jose, hold up, does the hetel he of not studying on Torah, not studying Torah during Christmas, still apply today, or is it just for certain specific communities? Okay, so let me give a little background for some people. Um, there is a sect within Hasidut, within Hasidut, uh, I think, I believe today it's mainly Chabad, that uh, at some point their Chachamim told them that not to study Torah on the day of Tum'ah for the Goyim, on their uh, Christmas day, uh, not to study Torah during that day, but rather uh, you know, because there is a, from their Chachamim decided there's a lot of Tumai in the world, a lot of demons in the world have resulted from all the sins that they're making during that uh, idol worshipping day, and you don't want to give the strength of the Torah to these Chitzonim, to these, uh, 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 you know, these other side beings, if you will. But this particular, so, so, so these parts of Hasidut, again, today I believe it's only Chabad, uh, every year they make it a, uh, a, a thing where on their uh, the 24th of December, I think it is, that uh, they don't study Torah during that night. Uh, they don't study Torah during the night, and they do other things like play chess and, uh, and, and the likes. Um, and, you know, so uh, th- this is like a, uh, the, the big sages of, 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 of these uh, Hasidut. That would be the one day a year that they would actually, you know, do things that perhaps they didn't do the whole year, uh, like play chess and, and other things like that. Now, this particular minhag, this custom, was not accepted, was not accepted among the majority of Klal Israel, and actually quite the opposite, quite the opposite. In fact, quite the opposite, where you should learn even more Torah, on this day because of all of the impurity that's being added to the world from this idolatry we in essence have to add more purity in the world more kedusha in the world to fight it uh that's why the uh uh, 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 uh he actually had a uh a yeshiva a bet midrash where he had two shifts of torah learners where each one would learn 12 hours and when they completed, the other one would continue to make sure that there is Torah being learned 24 hours a day, all year round. All year round. So the uh, the minhag of not learning on this, uh, this idol worshipping day was not accepted. Not back then and not today. Even more so not today of not learning Torah. You not only should learn Torah on this day, but you should actually learn extra Torah. Uh, and in fact, many Chachamim rebuked rebuked the people that did not learn Torah on this day because they saw that people not learning Torah ended up making a lot of mistakes during this day, making making many sins on this day, and it's a very, very big mistake. Uh, so again, we're not going against their Chachamim that originally instituted at their time. We don't believe even that they uh, planned on doing it permanently. We thought it was maybe for the time, but either way, this was not for all of Klal Israel, but rather for specific communities at that time, and it was rejected back then, and even more so today, uh, to for, for the rest of Klal Israel. Completely rejected. Uh, we need to learn Torah, as the Torah itself says to us, and there's a whole debate in the Gemara Masechet Brachot between Rabbi Shimon and Rabbi, Rabbi Ishmael about how much Torah you have to learn. And the, uh, they, they bring verses, V'yigita Boyoman Valayla, that you have to learn Torah day and night, all day, all night. And then the uh, Chachamim bring another verse. It says, If not for my covenant, meaning learning Torah day and night, if there isn't somebody learning Torah at some point, every single second of the day, Hashem at that point will destroy the world. Without a flood, without explosion, just simply the world will cease to exist. All the atoms will stop spinning and pretty much everything will just simply disappear. So, chas v'shalom, that Am Yisrael will stop learning Torah. Because Torah Ketoshah itself tells us that if Am Yisrael would stop learning Torah, Hashem will destroy the world instantly. Instantly, with no warning. So this is also one of the biggest reasons the Gemara itself, 
goes and rebukes anyone that follows this custom today, especially with those Chachamim no longer being in the world anymore. It's a uh, it's a very big rebuke because we need more and more Torah today more than ever. Uh, more than ever. So I, uh, I applaud you for asking the question and I highly, highly recommend everybody to learn extra Torah on that day uh, because there's so much impurity added to the world that we have to uh, we have to uh, fight it. Uh, Leah uh, is asking, Yaakov and Esav had the same voice. And Esav fooled Yitzchak into thinking that he was a tzaddik. Okay. But when Yaakov pretended to be Esav to get the blessings, he mentioned Hashem. Yitzchak became suspicious because Esav never mentioned Hashem. Shouldn't the fact that Esav would never mention or acknowledge Hashem be an indicator to Yitzchak that he wasn't really a tzaddik? To be in the mind of Yitzchak, you have to be Yitzchak. But I can tell you that uh, the the din from Shemaim, the din from Shemaim, was for it to be this way, was for it to be this way, where Yitzchak saw Esav from a different perspective than Rivka saw Esav, and uh, this was a few few reasons for it. Number one, Yitzchak grew up in a completely from house his whole life his whole life his father is the gdola do avram avinu his mom is sarai menu the gdola adora she's the biggest most righteous woman that ever lived uh so that's his parents all he sees is kedusha all day all night all he sees is new ballet shuvah coming in and and, uh, and uh you know becoming big tzadikim all he sees is you know holiness rifka on the other hand she grew up around Reshaim. She grew up against Betuel. Her father was a Rasha murderer. A, uh, the, uh, also did a lot of ugly things with, with, uh, with uh, other beings. Uh, in uh, Levan, the murderer, the gangster. That's who she grew up with. Her mom, the Midrash says, her mom was a, a filthy human being. So she grew up around horrible people. But yet she stayed holy. She stayed holy. But that doesn't mean she, she was a fool. Opposite. Because she was so righteous and so smart, she saw everybody for who they really were, and she knew that Esav was playing a game on Yitzhak, but Yitzhak couldn't see it. Why? Because he was like the Hasid of all Hasidim. He saw the best in everybody, and Esav only showed him good. Esav never showed him killing people. Esav showed him the opposite, where he would come to his father and say, Abba, I just got some salt. Do I have to give ma'asem on the salt? Do I have to get a tithe on the salt? Now, everybody knows that you don't have to give a tithe on salt. But Esav pretended to be so righteous that he said, look, I'm so precise with the halachot that, uh, you know, I, I want to even give uh, ma'asem, the tithe on salt. And on all types of similar things. So he, for, to do that, to play pretend, you don't have to mention Hashem. You don't have to mention Hashem. You just have to pretend like you're smart. There's many people that uh, pretend like they're smart all the time. I mean, you could actually see it if you read comments sometimes on my YouTube channel. You read comments, sometimes you'll see people that pretend to be smart. Uh, but you know, the only thing they're doing is they're just showing that they're obnoxious. Where uh, instead of instead of uh, watching the lecture, they determine what the lecture is about by the title and they decide to give you a whole write-up of what they think so this is a person that's pretending to be smart because if he was smart he wouldn't do such a thing he wouldn't do such a thing he would actually watch the lecture and know that there's more than to a book than just its cover but he's so obsessed with himself that he wants to give you his thoughts and his opinions or her thoughts or her opinions and many people are like that unfortunately there are many people that are pretenders they're pretenders like Esav but they sound like Yaakov where you have the uh, people that are simply wicked but they look righteous that's why the verse says Akol kol Yaakov Esav. the voice is the voice of Yaakov but the hands are the hands of Esav meaning that sometimes somebody sounds like Yaakov but in reality their actions are ugly like Esav's 
So this is a uh, many times in people that just portray hate for no reason. Like they, there's one one uh, one uh, menuval that uh, pretends to be a talmid chacham, and he decided that his life mission is to go and desecrate different talmid chachamim, particularly in this case the Tanya, the Baal Tanya, the, uh, the the one that started Chabad. Now, he's writing all types of things about the Tanya. He says, oh, I see over here, he said certain things, and it's uh, it's heresy. Tanya is a heretic, he says. What a rasha merusha, oy lo ve oy le olamo. Woe to him and woe to his world, this fool, this, this idiot. To say that the Tanya was a heretic, what an idiot, what a menuval. But if you actually look at this guy, what do you see? You see a bunch of other people following him because he says he's a rabbi. He says he did research. He uses all types of uh, sentences from the Tanya and he tells you this is what they mean and this is what they don't mean and he gives you his manipulated interpretations only to show what is he trying to do? He said, no, no, the Tanya is bad and I'm good. What are you trying to do? He's trying to build himself a stage. Trying to build himself a stage. First and foremost, if this Menuval is watching or any of his followers are watching, if the Gdolei Ado, like Rabu Vadya, like the Stipler Gaon, like many of the giants even outside of Chabad, never said a single word about such a thing, never said anything like that about the Tanya, and in fact celebrated the Tanya's Torah, said that it's Kodesh Kodeshim, and this, this Menuval, this despicable person from the year 5781, 2020, is going to come and say, Oh, he's a uh, he's a kofer, he's a heretic. The only an idiot would follow such words, and only an idiot will actually publicize such words. Why? Because if the gedolei adol did not say it, who are you? Who are you to say such a thing? Who are you? Now, if you're gonna go and you're going to say that someone today that's a nobody is a heretic because he clearly says that are things that are heretical that's a different story but to go say a gadol adol like the tanya is heretic who do you think you are the gemara in masechet avodah zara says such people that desecrate the chachamim and trufa le makato there's no cure to their ailment and i'm telling this to some of my own followers that i know brought this to my attention and i'm hoping you stopped it and you're throwing all this garbage out why? Because if you publicize this information, it desecrates big doleado from the past. I'm telling you, the amount of damage that's going to come to your life will not have a cure. It will not have a cure. Why? Because this Rasha that's doing it, he sounds like Yaakov, but what he's doing is the hands of Esav. You want to help Am Yisrael? You help Am Yisrael do tshuva. You help them keep Shabbat. 80% of Amisa don't keep Shabbat. You help Amisa stop wasting seed. Almost everybody wastes seed. You help Amisa learn about Brachot. Most people don't even know Brachot. You help Amisa about things that are relevant, not about something that you have an opinion on that nobody in the world agrees you with, agrees with. And you're going to say, no, no, but the Gaumi Vilna was against Hasidut. The way they implemented it, not the teaching itself. To manipulate the words of the of the even the mitnagdim like the gaomi vilna is wrong, but that's what happens when people are ignorant and they look at the title of rabbi as if it's a Moshe Rabbeinu, and people are making a mistake. They go against the gedolim. They look, they sound like Yaakov, but their hands are hands of Esav. So I highly, highly recommend anyone that's gonna say anything bad about any of the G'dolei Adol should think about it a thousand times and the only way you could ever say it is if you have a asmachta from a G'dol Adol. Only a G'dol Adol can say it. You can't say it. Why? You say it, you're putting yourself in trouble. You're putting yourself in trouble. It's a very big mistake. It's a very big mistake. It's, the Gemara, I'm telling you, says such horrible things of what happens to such people in, the, in this world and the next. Highly, highly recommend. There's a whole website that started doing the stupid things and there's one particular woman shemi shmo what she's bringing to our life uh, she is like highlighting this stuff all day she publicizes this garbage all day she publicizes this garbage on the internet to desecrating the chachamim but in the name of righteousness she thinks she's a tzedeket menuvelet that's all she is stupid is all she is desecrating the chachamim like that what are you listening to? This yo-yo, this idiot that says that the Gdolim are, 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 are heretics? 
Who do you think he is? You think he's bigger than the Gedolim that we had walking on earth today? If a Gedol adult today, if the Rav Kanievsky doesn't say it, who are you to say it? You have to understand, when I go say things about different Rashaim like Dol Kasuto and Manus Friedman, all that, I have permission to say it from the Torah, the Shai itself. I have Psak Alachat to do it. I have Rabbanim and Talmud Echachamim telling me to do it. It's not my own mind. To go against a Gadol Adol, it's, you're better off committing suicide than doing such a thing. It's such a, it's such a demented way of looking at things. And I'm telling you, I don't know who these people are. I don't have a personal relationship with them. And hence the reason why I'm not even mentioning their names. Don't ask me who they are. Whoever it is, knows who they are. Whoever it is, knows who they are. Stop it. You're going to ruin your life. I'm telling you, I don't even know if there's tshuva for what you've already done. What I recommend is you delete every single post you've ever made and simply don't talk permanently. Just be quiet. All you say is what Torah says from now on. That's how bad it is. I, I, I advised a couple of people to stop it. And I don't know if they listened or they didn't. And I'm telling you this because HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave, reminded me of this from these questions for some reason. To go back to your question and get myself to calm down a little bit from all the danger that people put themselves in. Listen. Yaakov Avinu was Kodesh Kodeshim was always in the yeshiva. Always talked about Bezrat Hashem. Always said Baruch Hashem. Esav on the other hand pretended to be tzaddik. So he talked about alachot but didn't really care about Hashem. Sometimes you have people, they learn alachot all day but they have no emunah whatsoever. Why? Because it's easy to learn alachot. It's like a robot. You learn, it's memorization. Memorization. A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D, E, E, E. It's not, uh, you know, learning alachot just yes, no. doesn't take much of a genius to do. Learning the the, the shelot v'tshuvot and learning who, what, when, and how it got to that's a different story. That's much higher level. But Esav, Esav was pretending to be smart. So it doesn't mean that he was talking about Hashem all the time. It just means that he was trying to make it seem as if he was very particular about mitzvot. But but uh, uh, it was obvious that uh, that uh, this was uh, him talking about Hashem was not uh, often. Because that's what the Midrash Rabbah says. The Midrash Rabbah says that as soon as Esav, uh, uh, as soon as Yaakov said, uh, Bezat Hashem, uh, that's the reason why I was able to hunt these animals so quickly, Yitzhak was taken back. Hold on a second. Esav, he tells me, he's a rationalist. Rationalist. He tells me, yes, no. Allowed, not allowed. Never talks about Emunah, Bitachon, Bezat Hashem, nothing like that. So that got Yitzhak off guard. Why? He says, it doesn't say it. But then he says, hold on a second. Let me see. And he feels his hands. He feels his hands. And he says, oh, that's the hands of Esau. So Yitzhak, what does Yitzhak do? He can't see. But also, not that only that he can't see physically, his prophecy didn't work at that moment because HaKadosh Baruch Hu stopped it. HaKadosh Baruch Hu stopped his prophecy at that moment. didn't allow him to see. Why? He wanted this to happen. There are certain times in the Torah that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, in essence, got involved for certain things to happen. He got involved, for example, for uh, for Yehuda, Yehuda to sin with Tamar. It says that Hakadosh Baruch Hu pushed Yehuda and gave him a, uh, a desire to be with uh, a woman that, for to his knowledge, uh, until later on, was a zona, was a prostitute. Gave him this crazy thought to go do it. Hashem gave him the thought. Hashem made him go do it. Gave him this unres- irresistible desire to go do it. Why? Because the Mashiach comes from that uh, relationship. The Mashiach came from that from that uh, from that relation that they had. Why? Because the uh, Chachamim in the uh, in Kabbalah tell us that this is in essence Hashem hiding things from the Satan. Not that Hashem is scared of the Satan, Chas v'Shalom, but in essence there are certain things that Hashem does to uh, to fool the Satan, to fool the Satan. So this is one of the things. Same thing is that it says with a uh, with David the Melech. You know, because uh, David Melech was really supposed to be a still life baby, meaning die at birth. That's what he was. There was no uh, years given to him. So the Satan that knew about this ahead of time said, "Oh, so this this guy is the only one that's going to bring salvation, but he's not going to live. So okay, so I'm freed. So you just got to make sure he doesn't come to life." But what happened? A uh, Adam Rishon gave him seventy years of his life. Uh, Pray to Hashem gave him seventy years of his life, and then later on Avraham Avinu gave him years. Point being is that these are different times that Akadosh Baruch Hu 
played with the uh, with the uh, with with the world, even with free choice to a certain extent. We also see it, see it with Paro. Kadosh Baruch Hu hardened the heart of Paro to make him say no to freeing Am Yisrael in order to embarrass him even more, in order to sanctify Hashem's name even more. Uh, so he made it so that he'd harden his heart. That's why he didn't kill Paro at the end. He let him live, and Paro became the uh, the king of uh, of Nineveh. He's the only one that survived, and the reason why is because Hashem played with his free choice. But Hashem did it for the sake of sanctifying his name and also embarrassing Egypt even more. Furthermore, Hashem uh, took the free choice away from the uh, Sichon. Sichon, he took the free choice from him and uh, made him decide to go to war with Am Yisrael. Now, you would think, oh, what's the big deal? The big deal is a lot of people went to war with Am Yisrael, but Sichon was a nation of giants. They were all giants, giants, huge, and children of the Nephilim. So for them to just decide to go to war with Am Yisrael was a very, very big deal. It was a very big deal, and obviously Am Yisrael defeated them. To give Am Yisrael more chizuk, so Hashem played with free choice over there to a certain extent. And the point is, is that there are certain times that HaKadosh Baruch Hu got involved more than he typically does to do certain things. Same thing happened with uh, with Yaakov. Yaakov Avinu, after, uh, you're going to read it uh, next week, uh, after uh, um, Yosef, after Yosef uh, was lost, Yaakov Avinu was still crying for past a year when the Torah says that the mourning is be- doesn't go beyond a year. Why? Because the heart forgets, forgets the pain. That's a part of the gift that Hashem gave us is, is forgetting, forgetting the pain. Because if we remembered every single pain we ever had as if it was today, we wouldn't be able to live. So, but yet Yaakov continued having the pain as if it was as if Yosef was murdered in front of him that day. A year later, two years later, three years later. So Chachamim say, oh, what a minute, hold on a second. Why didn't Yaakov just use his prophecy, just use his prophecy to see whether uh, whether uh, his son Yosef is still alive or not? Why did you use a prophecy? I mean, you have uh, Arab David Abu Chatzira, Arab David Abu Chatzira, one of the descendants of the Baba Sali and the, the Abu Chatzira family, Kodesh Kodeshin family. He was able just in our days, in our days, I'm talking about what three, four thousand years ago. In our days, in our days, he was able to use his kedusha to tell the police where a child was that was kidnapped. There was a child that was kidnapped maybe 30 years ago, 30, 25 years ago, something like that, uh, was kidnapped. They didn't know where he was. They looked everywhere. They couldn't find him. They went to, the family went to David Abu Chatzira, Rab David Abu Chatzira. They said, God, Rab, please help us. The kid's gone. Rab David Abu Chatzira focused all of his kavanot Focused, focused, focused. Oh, he gave him the exact address of where the kid is in France, in a different country. And they went, they found it. This was all over the papers. I wish I had the paper to show you. David Abuchatzir was able to do it. David Abuchatzir, in our days. So what is that? Why am I telling you this? If Arab Abuchatzir was able to do it in our days, in our days, what? Yaakov Avinu couldn't do it. Couldn't just figure out where Yosef and Sadiq is. HaKadosh Baruch Hu was hiding it from him. Was hiding it from him because that was part of Yaakov's tikkun and part of Yosef's tikkun. Part of Yaakov's tikkun for not uh, returning back to his parents to honor them faster than he did. And part of Yosef's tikkun because of the things that he said. And part of the whole world's tikkun because uh, Yosef had to become the viceroy of Egypt in order to protect all of Am Yisrael and for Am Yisrael to come. Point being is a lot of moving parts. Hashem had to get involved. Now guess what? On a side note, the whole 20 years that Yosef was missing and Yaakov was crying, Yaakov's father, Yitzchak, that couldn't see a Sav the Rasha in front of him, knew that Yosef is alive. Yitzchak Avinu knew that Yosef is alive and knew that his son is suffering because he doesn't know alive, dead, not alive, dead. He knew, and he didn't tell. Why? The Kadosh Baruch Hu said, Shh, quiet. It's his tikkun. Don't get involved. Don't get involved. Certain times. So, he knows that Yosef is in a different... Yitzchak Avinu knows that Yosef is in a different country. He's the king over there. He knows. But his son 
Esav, he didn't know he was a Rasha, to the same extent that he was. Why? HaKadosh Baruch Hu hid it from him. He hid it from him. For different reasons, and we can go into this for until the end of the world. Until the end of the world to learn about this. You go to Midrash Me'am Lo'ez, Midrash Rabbah, the Gemara, uh, Zohar, it's endless, endless, endless talk about this. Endless talk about this. But this is, again, it's a, uh, there's certain things that are Pshat, Remez, Sod, you have a lot of parts of the Torah, and each one is another layer of the onion, and it's a beautiful thing, Baruch Hashem. Beautiful thing. That's why we read the same parasha every single year. Why? Every year you learn something in the Baruch Hashem. Chazaku Baruch Leah. Next question. Uh, someone is asking, okay, someone is asking this. What happens to an animal's soul when it dies? An animal does not have a soul like a human being. It just has the nefesh. The nefesh is something that every creature in the world, whether it be a human, an animal, a plant, or e- e- uh, even a rock, everything has to have some type of nefesh in order to give it life, in order for it to exist in the world. A, a human being also has other parts, has the neshama and so on. Uh, but an animal just has the nefesh, just has the animal uh, spirit, if you will. And that animal spirit just uh, dies. That's it. It's, uh, it doesn't have a gan eden. doesn't have a genom. Unless in that animal is a reincarnation of a human being uh, that sinned and is being punished to return into the world as an animal. Uh, a couple of, uh, you know, there, there's a Shara uh, Gilgulim by the Arizal, or if you want to look at the uh, uh, the Rabbi Yudaftaya Sefer, uh, talks about Gilgulim, and uh, the Zohar Kadosh talks about Gilgulim, and many, many other places. Talk about reincarnation. We even talk about reincarnation in our prayer. Reincarnation is very much a, uh, a real part of Judaism. It's not, uh, it's not considered mystical Judaism. It's considered standard practice, standard Judaism. Anyone that says he doesn't believe in reincarnation is missing on uh, part of the Torah. It's in essence going against the dot of the Chachamim, uh, of our Torah. And reincarnation is a, uh, not only a form of Hashem giving us another chance uh, to fix things, but also it's a form of punishment or in a mix of both, if you will. And if a per, if a Jew makes certain sins, he has to reincarnate uh, as an animal. The two examples are that I can give you is if a Jew is intimate with a non-Jew. If a Jew is intimate with a non-Jew, they have to come back as an animal. Uh, it's a Gemara Meforeshet. Gemara specifically says, She's glued to him like a dog. Meaning, the uh, the uh, the Gaumi Vilna says, a person that was intimate with a, a Jewish person, was intimate with a non-Jewish woman, has to be reincarnated as a dog. Uh, and and uh, many, many other punishments, unless they do tshuva. If they do tshuva, they can eliminate this. And uh, now, that, that human being that reincarnated as a dog is suffering the whole time he's a dog. Is suffering the whole time he's a dog, and there's many stories uh, of, uh, of of uh, amazing things that happened. There's actually a uh, famous story by Rav Nissim again, where he saw in his own eyes. He one time Rav Nissim again, Allah Shalom, was Kodesh Kodeshim. What up? If, 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 if he was here today, if he was here today, I mean, it's uh, mamash. He kiss his feet, kiss his feet. I just spoke to his son not too long ago, and. Um, it's just uh, unbelievable, unbelievable uh, to, that there was such kedusha in the world just ten years ago. Ten years ago. Anyway, uh, Rav Nissim again, Allah Shalom. He was around a lot of supernatural things on a regular basis. All the craziest stories you could possibly imagine came to him on a regular basis. He was mamas like like the Rabbi the Fta'ir of the generation, if you will. He was uh, around this stuff all the time. Anyway, this is a story that he saw firsthand, and he says it in many of his lectures, not just one. And it's also written in his book, and so on. One time he came uh, to the United States, and he went to Los Angeles. And uh, the, the person that was uh, uh, driving him around said, let's go pray Mincha. And they went pray Mincha in the Kila over there in Los Angeles. And... Uh, once they got there, the, uh, the the guy that was taking him around was like, Rabbi, why don't you, why don't we go to this guy's house after Mincha 
and uh, you know mourn with him because he's a uh, uh, his son just died. So sure, let's go up. So they went to the guy's house. He says the house of this guy was like a castle, it was something out of this out of the movies, huge giant house, has you know stories in it and and, and all types of things, but Hashem Yishmael, death. Once you have death, everything else goes in the garbage. So they go inside, and uh, the the Balabite is uh, comes to the Rav and uh, says to the Rav, "I have to tell you something." And he sees that the wife is sitting over there smoking like a chimney, and she's saying, "Yeah, yeah," like she's nodding her head. She can't talk. Everybody's crying, but something what something happened there. Something happened there. He says, "What happened?" He says, Rav, everybody that's here, there was a bunch of people in the room. He says, everybody that's here saw this with their own eyes. Saw this with their own eyes. This happened last night. He says, what happened? He says, last night we prayed over here. Mincha in the house. Mourning for my son. And uh, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, a huge Rottweiler, huge Rottweiler, we don't, we don't have any dogs. A giant Rottweiler, black, started smashing on the door. So somebody brought a dog? No, no dog. Who's this? Mamash, right before that fill out, we didn't know what to do. Knocking on the door, knocking on the door. Barking, nothing. Nobody, nobody, nobody's scared to death. Who's going to open the door for this? After he barked for a little while, knocked on the door, so nobody's uh, nobody's uh, doing anything. He stopped and he left. So, okay, fine. The next thing you know, we're about to start praying. The Rottweiler was in the house. He went inside the house. He went, there's a secret entrance to the house that only family members knew. Only family members knew. This Rottweiler found this entrance and got into the house. And he went there and he sat right next to me. He didn't say nothing. He sat right next to me. He sat right next to me. I, I, I said, I looked at the Rottweiler and something came to, I saw his face and I said, no way, could it be? Is it him? And I just thought to myself, he said, nobody knows my thoughts. Nobody, nobody heard me say this. I just said in my head, the Balabite says, the father says, I said, if this is my son Hashem, please give me a clear sign. Tell him to go to his room. As soon as I finished this thought, the Rottweiler that was sitting next to me got up and went up the stairs. I followed him. Everybody's in shock the whole time. There's giant Rottweilers in the house. Nobody knows whose dog it is. I'm telling, I'm thinking to myself, this is my son. I follow the dog. The dog goes up. He goes into my son's room, jumps on the bed and lays down. At that moment, I started crying. I said, I knew this is my son. I knew this is my son. Later on, after that, he got. I, I brought him some food. I gave him some drink. I covered him. We went to sleep that night. In the morning, he was gone. So the guy says, "I love you again. Tell me the truth. Is it possible that that dog is my son?" I love you again. Didn't skip a beat. He wasn't politically correct. He knew the guy needs to hear the truth. And he tells the father, tell me the truth. Did your son have a non-Jewish girlfriend? And the father says, yes. He says, then that is your son. Your son had to be reincarnated as a dog because he was with a non-Jewish girl. what it is that's what it is this is one of the sins somebody has to be reincarnated as a dog another reason somebody uh after the story you think of something like this show me shmuel how many people are intermarried how many jewish people are intermarried in america it's over 80 percent somebody told me in denver it's 95 percent it's pretty much uh, tragedy tragedy so this means that not only are people uh, being intimate with non-Jewish people, girls, are, you know, Jewish girls, but not Israel, are with non-Jewish uh, men, 
or and vice versa, the guys, the Jewish guys are with non-Jewish women, not only that, but they're actually getting married to them, meaning became making it a permanent thing. Why? They don't know the truth. They don't know what's going to happen to them as a result of all this, not just in the next world, but even in this world. Everyone knows that those relationships that are from intermarriage end up being a disaster. Sometimes it uh, starts off as a disaster. Many times it's later on becomes a disaster. But surely, even if they're not religious, it's always a disaster. Intermarriage is always a disaster. There is no such thing as a happy intermarriage. It's, it's against the teva of the world. It's against the nature of the world for it to be a happy marriage. It could pretend to be happy because of lust and things of that nature. But later on, it becomes a disaster. A lot of tragedies come to them. A lot of dinim come to both of them because, in essence, they're both considered wicked. The, the, the non-Jew is considered a murderer. The Jew is considered a, a, a person that's a rasha. It's a very big problem. Anyway, so someone that's uh, intermarried with a non-Jewish person has to reincarnate as a dog. Uh, and uh, that's a tragedy, unless they do tshuva. To do tshuva for it is not an easy thing. Why? Because you have to first and foremost stop which is in itself probably the most difficult thing. Second of all, you have to learn about the topic to make sure you never go back. Never ever do it again. Not for fun, not, not for fun. No reason ever again. Number three, you have to apologize to HaKadosh Baruch Hu about this. Apologize with tears. Hamas, tears. Next thing is you have to help other people. You have to help other people do tshuva for their intermarriage, for their for their uh, uh, promiscuous relations with, uh, with non-Jewish uh, people. Uh, again, non-Jewish and non-Jewish, perfect. Jewish and Jewish, perfect, as long as they're married. But a non-Jew and a Jew, tragedy for both of them. Tragedy for both of them. This is not a uh, a racism of Jewish people. This is a Kadosh Baruch Hu's rules, the Shem's rules. He said we're not allowed to do it, and that's his, it's his world to run. Uh, you know, so it's uh, important for people to know. Uh, as far as the um, as far as the last part of the uh, how a person that did uh, was intimate with a non-Jew, they have to uh, do tikkunim. They have to do tikkunim, which is a uh, every single time that they were intimate with the uh, with the uh, someone that's not Jewish, they have to fast 82 times. Now, of course, uh, nobody today can really fast that many times. So the chachamim, uh, one of them actually being the Balatanya, the Arizal. And many of the other chachamim say that since people are weak now, they can't fast, they can replace the fast with money. So how much money? For every fast, replace it with a meal, a value of a meal. How much, let's say, cost you for the day to uh, to eat? Let's say it costs you $5 to eat a day. Not your regular meal, whatever. You could survive on $5 worth of food, $10 worth of food a day. So it's $10 times 82 fasts. And that's... $820, you give it for the sake of Torah. You give it for the sake of teaching this specific subject. So somebody wants to make a, 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 a marketing for this specific segment of what we just talked about. They want to market it. They take $820 and we market this particular video. And that's a tikkun for one time. For one time that they did a sin. Now if they were with somebody for many, many times, they did this in many, many times, they have to do this tikkun many times. Now you're going to say, wait a minute, so if by the time a guy finishes, you have to be a millionaire to do it. Yeah, you have to be a millionaire. So does, expect, does Hashem expect you to be a millionaire? If he gave you the money, then you should do it. If you don't have the money, then he expects you to do it with whatever you do have. Meaning, if you have only $800, then you do $800. But if you have uh, $800 a month, then you do $800 a month. If you have $800 a year, you do $800 a year. Whatever you do, and you, in essence, most people have to do it in, uh, in increments throughout the year uh, and for a long period of time. Uh, some people that are that have the money and also have the brain and have the Yirat Shemaim, they write a big check and they finish. That's the way. You don't want to you, you do it? Don't do it. It's your life. But that's the, uh, that's, that's the key. Uh, the other thing that I know that there's a Gilgul that a person can come back as an animal is for stealing. If he stole money that belongs to somebody else, dishonest business and things of that nature, many times uh, the person has to reincarnate as an animal that works for the person that he stole from. There's a very famous story by uh, that I mentioned in the past by uh, the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov uh, had a uh, horse that he knew was a reincarnation of the uh, uh, of its owner's uh, friend. And uh, he, he helped him do a tikkun. 
So why did he why did he have to come back as a horse? Because he borrowed money and didn't pay back. That's considered stealing. So uh, it's important that uh, a person does not have any stolen money on their hands. You have stolen money on your hands. You have to return it to where you stole it from. If you can't return it to where you stole it from, for whatever reason, whether it's uh, because the person or the entity is is gone, it's no more in the world, or it will put you in trouble. Meaning, like if you return the money to the organization, they may press charges and put you in jail. So what do you do? You take that money that you stole and you give it to Kiruv. You give it to a public cause that this entity or this person can benefit from somehow. Uh, you could also give it to like a homeless shelter, whatever is a public cause, but there's obviously nothing better and more public than Kiruv. Stolen money is not money that you want in your hands. Why? Because it's cursed money. It's cursed money. So you have stolen money, get rid of it as soon as possible. I have a, a person that I know already for several months. He's doing his best to give a few dollars every month, a few dollars every month just to get out of it. I have some people, they have millions of dollars stolen, they don't want to know. No, 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 Hashem's going to forgive me. Okay, Hashem's going to forgive me. Good luck with that. So, a person like that doesn't do tikkunim, doesn't do tshuva, has to reincarnate as a dog. Has to reincarnate as a different animal, horse or something else. So, yeah, yeah. So, without having that neshama chaim, without having that extra neshama of a human being, an animal just simply disappears. Why? Because it was created to serve men. But if it has a human neshama in it, then in essence it's a form of uh, punishment for that person. And after that animal fixes itself, that animal completes the tikkun, then it uh, would uh, most likely have to come back to the world again as a human being, or perhaps go uh, to the next part of its tikkun somewhere else. Uh, whether it be heaven or genom, or kafake, or wherever, it's different, different uh, places depending on the person. Next. Uh, replying to Leah, George Frieda Isaac is replying to Leah. Yitzhak told Esav, when you bring me... Oh, okay, so you're replying. Thank you very much. I should have saved myself a half hour. I have Isaac over here. I have, uh, you know, uh, replying. Uh, Nicole Batista, how are you? Shalom lekulam. Rabbi Uven, I have a question in regards to women's prayer. Can I say the morning prayer before the sun is up? Since there is no time frame for women, uh, thank you in advance. Ah, it's a very good question. So yes, there is no time frame for a woman to pray, but it still has to be an appropriate time. Meaning, you cannot pray the Arvit at the time of Shachrit. You can't pray Musaf on a regular Tuesday. You know, so it's a, it's a, it's yeah. There's no specific time that you have to pray. But, you have, but whenever you pray, it has to be the right prayer. It has to be the right prayer of that time. So the Birkot uh, shachar and the Tefillah of the morning has to be at, uh, at Nets. Nets is the earliest time that you can do it. Uh, Nets, you can, to find out when Nets is uh, in the morning where you are is, you can download uh, an app called uh, CalJ, C-A-L-J, and it tells you every morning uh, based on your zip code, what time is nets, and that's when you can start praying. You can pray your tefillot, berkot shachal and your morning prayer if you want to pray in the morning. Most women that I know split it up, split it up, where in the morning, many times they're very busy with the kids, with running around, and they don't usually get not busy at any point because the kids, you know, are in, out, school, not school, life, and so on, and uh, if you're going to wait until everybody's asleep every day, Sometimes you're so tired you can't you don't even have the energy to pray. So most women that I know break it up where in the morning they do the Birkot Shacha, the morning prayers takes two three minutes, which is believe me it's very hard for women to even get those two three minutes with all the kids screaming everywhere sometimes in the morning. But anyway, Birkot Shacha you gotta do you feel you know until you die washing your hands bathroom and then the Birkot Shacha that you have to do as soon as you possibly can in the morning as soon as you wake up that you could do at any time. Then uh, many of them do the Shema Israel in the morning, that section of Shema Israel, uh, which again also it only takes a couple of minutes, two, three, four, five minutes, uh, maybe a little longer, but uh, you know, it's, it depends on the person. But the Amida, the Amida, uh, they uh, do later on. Uh, many times they do later on because to do all of it together sometimes will take you know half hour that they don't have, twenty five minutes that they don't have. 
So uh, what, end, what they end up doing is they do the Bikot HaShachar, the uh, Shema Yisrael section, and then they'll do Amidah as, let's say, a part of their prayer in a, uh, you know, in a Shachrit or, uh, or, uh, or, uh, or Arvit, or at some other point they'll do it. The main things for a woman is to say that Bikot HaShachar, Shema Yisrael, and Amidah at any time during a day, any time during a day. If you're going to do the whole prayer, though, you're going to do the whole shachri, the whole mincha, the whole arvi, then it has to be in the appropriate time. It has to be in the appropriate time. But the main thing is, if you're that you, you literally have no room to breathe, the minimum of minimum every day is Bekot HaShachar, the Shema Yisrael section, and the Amida. That's, and you could even break those up. I mean, it's ideally... Lechatchila, actually, this is a very good example. Lechatchila, it would be all of them and the complete prayer. Uh, that's lechatchila. But it's a uh, uh, because of the situation. This is one of those places where bediava the person can uh, break it up because of the circumstances, because of the circumstances of kids and so on. Next question. Uh, Yaakov in Brachot Perek 4 Rabbi Eliezer says I'll say Tfilato Keva and Tfilato Tachnunim okay how can one truly pray with Kavana without getting distracted I'm getting distracted while I'm, talk, while I'm reading um, let's see hold on a second I'm not to talk so much how can one truly pray with Kavanah without getting distracted? I know the Ramban, and he gets the Ramban, says to remove the worldly things from his heart, but how does one do that? I know of many Sfarim which talk about the meaning of Tefillah itself, but are there any which discuss and explain how a person is supposed to actually pray once he knows what he's saying? Yes, our series, Igeret Ramban, has a whole lecture about this question. About this question, that very same section that you're talking about, the, that the Ramban talks about prayer and so on, I have a whole lecture about it. two hours, two and a half hours talking about tefillah. Watch the lecture; it, it's, it'll give you much bigger and better answer than I can give you right now. Next question, Jimmy: Should we celebrate our birthdays? If so, how do we not bring all the glory to ourselves? Um, Sorry, I have to drink something. Uh, should you celebrate your birthday? I don't know. I mean, if you, if you mean celebrate your birthday, like people make a big deal out of it and they have a whole party and, and things like that, it's not really a minhag that uh, Ami said does. It's really more of minhag of the uh, custom of the non-Jews. Uh, the only people that are mentioned in the Torah that celebrated their birthday are Paro and Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, and also, and I'm sorry, in Chashverosh, in Chashverosh, they celebrate their birthday. These weren't weren't exactly good people. Uh, you never heard about, uh, you know, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu celebrating his birthday or Avraham Avinu celebrating his birthday. Uh, is it a sin to celebrate your birthday? No, but it's just not a uh, customary. And the reason why is because the Chachamim looked at the birthday as a uh, as an opportunity to uh to do tshuva to get closer to hashem to give other people blessings because this is the day that hashem gifts them what they uh what they want in essence like their birthday like he says in Tehilim to david melech you know this is like your birthday ask what you want and i'll give it to you uh so it's it's a, it's a good day for a person to bless people uh and but that means that they have to be uh, focused and understanding that this is a time that uh, they have to be connected to Hashem. If your bu- person is busy drinking tequila and, uh, and arak and all types of other uh, liquors and uh, you know forgetting the, the significance of the day, uh, he's not going to get uh, done what he's supposed to get done. Um, hold on a second. I have this alarm somewhere in my office. I don't know where it is, but he makes noise every day at exactly the same time. One day I'm going to find it. So anyway, uh, so the day of a birthday, a person should uh, bless people that he cares about. 
uh, should pray to Hashem, should connect it, but also know that the Chachamim were scared to celebrate too much on their birthday because it's in essence one day closer to death. And no one was so confident about their merits, like as if, you know, no one was confident that if they died that day, uh, they would go to heaven. So they uh, they were scared of their birthday, if you will, because uh, this is a reminder that perhaps they haven't achieved anywhere near as much as they need to. Uh, anywhere as near as much as they need to. So uh, this is why uh, celebrating a birthday like the uh, like people do today is not really a custom of uh, religious Jewish people. Um, and last but not least, like I said about a birthday, is that you have to make sure that you celebrate your Hebrew calendar birthday, not your uh, secular calendar, Gregorian calendar birthday, because the Gregorian calendar, uh, as we learned from the Gemara in Masechet Rosh Hashanah, uh, the uh, Gregorian calendar is a flawed calendar where your birthday, uh, let, let's say, for example, call it July 1st, uh, you know, 30 years ago, is not really the same day, you know, uh, July 1st. It's really not the same day. Why? Because the Gregorian calendar has a calendar system that uh, has all types of calculations that are in essence incorrect. Uh, whereas the, um, uh, the the Jewish calendar, if you were born on Rosh Chodesh Kislev, the first of Kislev, let's say, or the you know first of Nisan or whatever day uh, in the Jewish calendar, 30 years ago, that 30 years forward, it's going to be the same day. It's going to be the first of Kislev or, or, or whatever day, Nisan and so on. So you celebrate your Jewish birthday. As a side note, converts... Converts, people that convert to Judaism, your birthday is the day of conversion. The day of conversion is your birthday. Your secular birthday is no longer valid at all. It's no longer connected to you at all. It has no significance whatsoever. The day you convert, the day you dip into the mikveh, that's officially your birthday. And that's the only birthday that uh, you should take into account. The other birthday that you had in the past, you shouldn't celebrate, shouldn't connect to it and uh, within a few years, uh, even forget it's even it. Uh, I, I know that uh, uh, one time uh, uh, my my wife and I, God bless her, uh, we um, talking and then just out of the conversation, my I remember like, oh man, wow, your uh, your uh, the, the birthday, secular birthday was two days ago. She looks at me and goes, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, no, it was this. She goes. Both of us forgot. Both of us forgot. Two days later, we remembered. Two days later, we remember, I remember that she forgot all, all together. She had to, we had to double check. <laughs> it was two days later. You disconnect from it. Disconnect. This is like a previous carnation. Only the birthday you celebrate is the birthday of your conversion. Noahides celebrate their, uh, you know, celebrate their uh, uh, Gregorian calendar or the Hebrew calendar. You could, you could do Hebrew calendar would be the Gregorian calendar. Find out exactly the day, exactly the day that you were born, um, you know, 30 years ago. There is a goat online to a uh, Hebrew calendar converter, which converts the secular days to uh, to uh, um, uh, Jewish uh, calendar birthdays, and that way you'll know when you were born 30 years ago, whenever it was. Call it, let's say, the second of Kislev or the first of uh, Cheshvan or whatever it is. So now, from that moment, you can, it's not an obligation, but you can, if you want, uh, you know, have a more precise birthday calculated based on the Hebrew calendar. You can, you can, you don't have to. It's just a thought that I have. Uh, that's it. Uh, and I think everything I said answers your second question about bringing glory to yourself because once you understand your birthday you realize there's no glory in it it's simply a reminder that you have less time in the world to complete your mission uh, before going to the eternal world next question uh, Elchanan uh, we learned that Yaakov Avinu came back from Levan's house unarmed by uh, unharmed unharmed by any of the Tumah there, mainly because the Torah he learned from the yeshiva of Shem and Evel. How can we make the Torah we are learning protect us from all the Tumah around? Uh, 
Uh, well, you continue listening to the shulim that we're doing. You continue applying as much of them as possible as you can. You continue learning Gemara with your brother and eating up the Masechet after Masechet. You continue uh, uh, building that beautiful household with your very dear wife, with full of Kedusha. And you actually, you know what? Follow this Alecha. Hey, we looked at this Alecha recently, uh, yeah, earlier. Follow this Alecha. Follow this Alecha. Is Alecha for you and your wife and for everybody's wife. Rambam. The Rambam in Ilchot Ishut. Rambam in Ilchot Ishut. Um, which is uh, the laws of between uh, laws of women, if you will, uh, says the following: In Chot Yishu, chapter sixteen, verse nineteen, Alacha uh, uh, number nineteen, says, "Our sages commanded that a man honor his wife more than his own person. Meaning, you have to give more kavod to your wife than even you give kavod for yourself." You may be willing to walk around with a simple shirt, but you should never let your, your wife walk around with something simple. You may be willing to walk around without necessarily taking care of yourself, but you have to make sure your wife takes care of herself. You may be willing to, uh, you know, have somebody insult you, but you should never allow anyone else to insult your wife. So you have to give more kavod to your wife. And love her as he loves his own person. You have to love your wife as much as you love yourself. Uh, if he has financial resources... He should offer her benefits in accordance with his resources. Never ever, a guy is never allowed to be cheap with his wife. Never allowed to be cheap with his wife. He has to buy her dresses and shoes and bags and whatever she wants, buy her as long as you can afford it. If you can afford it, buy her. No, never be cheap with your wife. Never say, listen, honey, you know, you already have a dress. Don't buy another one. No, if you have the money, buy it. Why? You're only going to go and learn Torah because... Of the kedusha that she has as well, to, to make sure the house is uh, is taken care of, the kids are taken care of, and so on. You have to make sure that she's happy. If she's happy because she got another dress or she got another shoe or she got another bag, buy it. You have the money, buy it. The, the, if Hashem wants you to have more money in retirement, I'll give you money for retirement. You have to worry about retirement thirty years before retirement. You have to worry about your wife being happy today. So, a guy is never allowed to be cheap with his wife. Guys that are cheap with their wife are ruining their own blessing. They're ruining their own blessing. Uh, so, because Alakha here, it's, it's much it's a violation of the Torah. Rambam says that he has to offer these benefits in accordance with resources. Meaning, if he's rich, he has to make sure that his wife looks rich. She can't look like some cleaning lady, uh, you know, in the middle of her job. If he has a million, two million, five million in the bank, his wife has to look the part. She has to look fancy. Why? Because he is rich. She has to look rich. His kids too, by the way. But uh, that's Rabbi, Rabbi Udanasi says that. He rebuked one of the people uh, that he, he saw his son dressing like a regular person uh, when he knew he was rich. He says that you're making a sin dressing your son like a regular person when he's rich. Not like, look, uh, like a poor person if you're rich. So the point is, is that a guy that has resources has to make sure that his wife looks good. You know, whether that's jewelry or dresses, of course, all with modesty and so on. But he has to be generous with his wife. Uh, again, as long as she's not like, you know, one of these crazy people that's going to spend $50,000 on a handbag that you're going to use once. A person like that, unless you have, I don't know, tens and tens of millions of dollars, uh, there's no uh, no reason to ever do such a thing. But if a person is a uh, has resources, he has to be generous with his wife. And then Allah continues, he should not cast an excessive measure of fear over her. Don't be one of these people that scares your wife to death. You know, ah, you forgot the salt? Oh, you walk around. Uh, oh, eh. Don't do that. Don't make your wife scared of you. Don't make your wife scared of you. She should be scared of you because you have Yilat Shemayim. Not because uh, you're a scary uh, monster in the house. And you should talk with her gently, being neither sad nor angry. That's what the Rambam, that's the of the Rambam for the husband. We talk to her, talk to her gently. And uh, now why is this, why is he meant to talk to her gently? Well, we need the Rambam to remind us to be gentle and, and uh, when we talk to our wives and not sad and angry, yes, yeah, we need, he's telling us it's a law, it's not a suggestion, it's a law, you have to. Why? Because sometimes it's very easy to lose your mind on your wife because sometimes they're a little bit uh, frustrating and annoying and this and pushy and this and that. So you want to yell, you want to scream, you want to do a lot of things. Rambam says you do that and you're sinning. You're sinning. You have to train yourself to calm down. Why? 
His wife is like himself, it's like his body. He has to give her more cover than himself. What about the wife? What is the wife obligated to do? Next, Allah, Allah number 20, chapter 16 of uh, the uh, Ilchot issued by the Rambam. Uh, Allah number 20. And similarly, the sages commanded a woman to honor her husband exceedingly and to be in awe of him. Meaning she has to give him more kavod than anybody else in the world, including her father. She has to give more kavod to her husband than anybody else in the world. Above and beyond. Deserve it, not deserve it, doesn't make a difference. He's a husband, that's it, he's the king of the house. No one's allowed to insult him. No one's allowed to go. She is like a lioness. Lioness, how much? Lioness. It's a very, very important for the wife to have a lot of kavod for the husband. If she doesn't have a kavod for the husband, the kids are not going to have kavod for him. And if the kids don't have kavod for him, they're going to destroy the house. They're going to destroy the house. Why? Because the kids are typically not scared of the mother. They're scared of the father. But if the, if the mom doesn't respect the father, then the kids are not scared of anybody. They do whatever they want. They wreck the house. It's not a good thing. And it says she should be in awe of him. Meaning, not only not only have a lot of respect for him, but have awe, a much serious, like all like you have uh, all of Hashem. You're not Shemaim. Why? I don't want to. I don't want to hurt our relationship. I don't want to, you know, dishonor him. I don't. She has to be in awe of him. Now, of course, again, a person needs to do everything within reason, not be crazy. Uh, you know, to to a point where it's a uh, it's like uh, hurting her uh, her life. She shouldn't like fast the whole day just to make sure that our, our husband is happy with the food first or something crazy like that. People need to be reasonable and normal. If he gives her the right amount of kavod, she's going to know how to honor him. If she doesn't, he doesn't give her the kavod, she's not going to know how to honor him. You know, many times you have people turning their wives into, uh, into servants or many times the wives turn their husbands into slaves. It's not good. So Rambam says you should have to have a lot of kavod for him, a lot of honor of him, and be in awe of him. She should carry out all of her deeds according to his directives, considering him like an officer or a king. This Allah Rambam. The woman has to do what her husband says. Chazal says there's no woman that's kosher that doesn't listen to her husband. If she wants to be like one of these feminists, one of these bossy women, wants to tell everybody what to do, including her husband, she's definitely not a kosher woman. Definitely not a kosher woman. It's not possible. A lot of these women that uh, that pretend to be Talmidei Chachamim, they pretend to uh, to be uh, sages on the internet and other places, they even yell at their husbands, tell them, oh no, my husband doesn't know anything, I know more than him. For sure not kosher women. For sure not kosher women. Right? The Rambam says it. Chazal says it. Why? She has to treat her husband like a king. A king. What about if he doesn't know Torah? Doesn't matter. How do we know? Chana and Elkanah. Elkanah was not a Tamit Chacham. Elkanah was not a Tamit Chacham. Chana was Kodesh Kodeshim, was a prophet. What'd she do? Did she disrespect her husband? Chazbe Shalom. She gave a lot of kavod for her husband. She told him, listen, you could do the Ptilim. You could do the Ptilim and uh, put the light in menorah. And that's why they called him Lapidot. They called the uh, Elchanah Lapidot. He became a prophet as a result of this. He wasn't a prophet because he knew a lot of Torah. He was a prophet because he loved the mitzvot. But that's only because his wife gave him a good advice because she gave him a lot of respect. A wife doesn't respect her husband, tells her husband what to do, who, what, when, and how. It's not a kosher woman, and it's only a matter of time before she cheats on him. Because that's what's happening today. Just today, we got two phone calls. Two phone calls from people, women. Women. Pretend to be religious, got five, six, seven kids, but uh, they're cheating on their husbands. Actually, I'm sorry. One was cheating on her husband, one was cheating on his wife. Two different things. Both today. Why? Not kosher people. Not kosher people. Not not kosher. They eat kosher, they go to synagogue, but the relationship has no no compliance in it with the Torah. No compliance in it with the Torah. So the Rambam continues. She should follow the desires of his heart and shun everything that he disdains. He doesn't like it, she doesn't like it. He likes it, she tries to get herself to like it. Why? That's going to make him happy. Now, of course, again, everything within reason and common sense. If your husband is a sick person 
is mentally sick and he likes weird things, you're not obligated to like these weird things. But if it's a, if your husband is a, a normal person, has he got shemaim and so on? Don't ask him to go to your uh, your your girlfriend's uh, daughter's bar mitzvah if he says no, I don't want to go to these things. No, but they're going to be offended. Let them be offended. You have to make sure you have a good shalom bite. Don't take your husband to places he doesn't want to go to. You know, again, sometimes you need to go to, especially when it comes to immediate family and things of that nature. There's certain things you need to go to, there's certain things that you should go to. This is sometimes you want to even ask your rabbi. But most important thing is, don't make your husband do things they don't want to do and vice versa. Don't make your wives do things they don't want to do. Don't make your wives go to your parents' house every weekend just because you want to uh, make sure that your parents are happy with her. Don't torture your wife like that. Don't live with your parents or your parents after you get married. It's a bad idea. It's a bad idea for everybody. Lastly, it says, this is the custom of holy and pure Jewish women and men in their marriages. And these ways will make their marriage pleasant and praiseworthy. This is what the Alakha is, Rabotai. She has to make him into a king. He has to make her into a queen. If you make your wife into a queen, she can now make you into a king. If, she, if you make your husband into a king, he'll make you into a queen. But if you make your husband into some slave that's just there to make money for you, guess what? He won't treat you like a queen. He won't. And vice versa. So you do that, El Khanan, you keep learning the Shulim, you keep learning the Gemara, you keep building the Kodesh, Kodeshim house that you have. The Torah that you have will protect you from everything that's around you. Uh, next question. Uh, great question. Oren Sadok is wasting seed karet. Yes, wasting seed is karet. The uh, Torah says it in many places that uh, wasting seed is karet. And uh, worse yet, the uh, the Reshit um, Chokma, Rav Vidas, it was a big Mekubal almost 500 years ago at the time of the Shulchan Aruch. Uh, it was a Mekubal by every major Chacham before and uh, after him uh, and during his time. Uh, Rav Vidas writes in Rashid Chokma, Masechet Genom, that someone that weighs seed uh, not only has no share of the world to come, but also goes to the seventh level of Genom and doesn't come out. Doesn't come out. So this is a very serious problem. The, uh, the Gemara Masechet uh, Nida uh, says that someone that weighs seed is like someone that uh, brought on the flood and has no share of the world to come. So and then on and on and on, we have a whole series of lectures about wasting seed. A person must do tshuva for it. And tshuva for it is very similar to what I said about in regards to uh, tikkun goya uh, or tikkun goy, where you have to stop, obviously. You have to learn about the topic in order to give yourself offense to, you know, beat this uh, this addiction. You have to say, I'm sorry to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You have to help other people do tshuva for it. And you have to do tikkunim. You have to do the tikkunim. This is important to do the tikkunim as soon as you have an ability to do it. A lot of guys and girls that have made the sin of promiscuity with themselves and with other people are uh, stingy when it comes to doing tikkunim. No, no, I'll just send $20. Okay, if all you have is $20, chazaku ba'ol for saying $20. But if you got $20,000, 50000 100000 or more in your bank account and all you're sending is $20, you're, 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 you're selling yourself short. You're going to regret it because the money that you have, you can't take with you. You can't take with you. Whereas the money that uh, the tikkun, you are taking with you. So it's a mistake. But again, it's a uh, everybody has to pass their own test. Next, was Joseph's dream fulfilled? The 11 stars bow down and the sun, uh, but I didn't see that in the Torah, that the moon bow down to Joseph. I mean, technically, the, the dream was fulfilled uh, that uh, all of his a uh, all of his brothers did end up bowing down to him, and uh, even his uh, his father uh, Yaakov, his father Yaakov uh, was a uh, in essence under his uh, uh, you know uh, leadership in uh, in Egypt, uh, but uh, as far as the um, the moon is not Bilah. 
the moon is his mom is Rachel. Rachel is his mom. Uh, Rachel is the mom of Yosef. Um, as far as Rachel bowing to him, no, obviously she already uh, died at that time. She died at that time uh, before before he became the viceroy. Um, Yaakov, my family celebrates Thanksgiving. My family th- celebrates Thanksgiving by eating a meal, but that's all. May I go just so my parents do not get upset, so my grandparents are happy to see me, but I will sit on the side learning Chumash. Yaakov, no. No. Uh, you know, you, you, you are... You know, you have to understand that being part of a meal of Thanksgiving is, in essence, giving it credibility. Um, you know, and it's a and uh, to be part of that meal and not say anything as if nothing's going on. In essence, everyone is not going to know that this is problematic. Now, this is if you are an adult. If you're an adult, if you're an adult, you live in your own house, you're married, and so on. You should not go to your parents' house and uh, and celebrate uh, Thanksgiving with them. Now, if you're a child. Uh, still living with your parents, you're you know, a young teenager, 12, 13 years old, 14 years old, living in your parents' house, uh, then the lechatchila, the ideal situation where you should do, because your parents are going to celebrate and they're not going to listen to you no matter what you say, you're just a little teenager. Uh, so you can't tell them to stop uh, and, and expect them to listen to you because you're just a young kid. Uh, so the chatchila, what you should do is, uh, you know, try to escape it. You know, go to the Bet Midrash, go to the local kolel, and just pretty much stay there all day. Uh, stay there all day, and uh, this way you could uh, escape the whole dinner of. Uh, of uh, that's the chatchila. Bediavad, meaning if you can't escape your house. Uh, you can't escape your house, then uh, you uh, simply could uh, uh, do what you're saying, is sit on the side, learn chumash. I mean, they're probably going to bust your chops a little bit and tell you why you're doing that. And, uh, you know, you should tell them it's because this is not a Jewish holiday. This is a, uh, you know, this is a desecration of, uh, of our Torah, really. You should tell them, because if you don't tell them, they'll never know. If you don't tell them, they'll never know. So you should you should tell them that this is not a Jewish holiday. Uh, at least they'll know. At least they heard it once. Maybe you could even watch uh, the shiur that I made about it together with them. At least make that dinner into something uh, useful. Next. Uh, thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Nicole, for the question. Yaakov. Also, may I eat turkey if they ask me to just so they don't get upset? Again, like I said, to eat the turkey, Rav Avigdor Miller says, is avak avodazara. So uh, I would recommend not to eat the turkey under any condition. If one of the gedolim, like Rav Avigdor Miller, says that it could be even considered avodazara, then it doesn't matter how much your parents are going to get upset. No, don't eat the turkey. Don't take part of that meal. Go eat a uh, you know a kosher donut or something. You know, don't don't be part of it. Don't be part of it, even if you're a young kid. Don't be part of it. Don't uh, make it as if it's not a, a big deal. I'm not saying to go start screaming and yelling, but just say, listen, I don't want it. I don't want it. To, you know, you guys can do whatever you want. I'm not telling anybody what to do. Tell them. But, you know, according to what I learned, what Rav Moshe Feinstein said, what uh, Rabbi Ruben uh, quoted in his name, what Rav Vigdor Miller said, uh, you know, we're not allowed to celebrate it. And, uh, you know, I don't want it. If you don't want to deal with the headache, you could, I don't know, I guess you could pretend like you're sick or something and don't want the food. Uh, but you should definitely not be part of the meal. You should definitely not be part of the meal. That uh, that could even be Chilul Hashem. You know, because in essence, if your parents are still celebrating Thanksgiving, that means that you're probably the only religious one in your house. Uh, and they look at you as the one that's like the rabbi of the house, even if you're a young teenager. And uh, which means that if you're eating with them, that's in essence kosherizing their activity. It becomes chilul Hashem. So it's even more responsibility on you not to do it. Not to do it at all. I'm not saying to start yelling at them and argue with them, but to be take part of it is absolutely not a good idea. So, uh, Rabbi, I've been very poor, homeless, and unable to provide properly for my son. 
I now have a job, Baruch Hashem, that pays very well. And my son, young son, has everything he needs to live happy and healthy. But I often cannot get home until about an hour after Shabbat begins. If I take, if I take a taxi home on Shabbat night, can I temporarily keep my job? Or should I quit now and risk falling behind again on my important respons financial responsibilities? Saul, if you are Jewish, then this is not a question. If you are Jewish currently, there's, there's no question whatsoever. You are not allowed to violate Shabbat for any job in the world unless your job is saving lives, literally. You're a doctor or a surgeon of some kind. Uh, you are a, uh, you know, something that has to do with saving lives uh, on a regular basis. If it's not, if you just, let's say, I don't know, some type of engineer or, uh, I don't know, sanitation department or whatever uh, regular job you have, there is no permission whatsoever for you to violate the Torah and violate Shabbat. No permission. So uh, you have to tell your job, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to uh, work on Fridays uh, past afternoon, let's say, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, because i got to get home for Shabbat. And pray to Hashem that they let you do it. And even if they don't, you do it anyway. I have a guy that uh, years ago, maybe six years ago, he was working at AT&T. And uh, before he met me, he was an atheist. After three lectures, he was already keeping mitzvot. But he had a problem with Shabbat. Why? Because the company he was working for at the time, uh, AT&T, uh, had a schedule where, a, where a, uh, you know, he would work on Shabbat. That was a schedule they gave him. He would work every Shabbat. And so he would keep Shabbat on Friday night, but then he would go to work on, on Saturday because he said, if you don't come in, he asked him, can you let me go on Shabbat? And he said, no, you have to work. That's your schedule. Uh, you know, you, you have to get uh, to work. You know, so after, uh, after that, he told me, what do I do? I told him, you don't show up. You can't work on Shabbat. You can't. He's like, yeah, but they're going to fire me. I said, let them fire you. If they fire you, he goes, well, I'm going to eat. I said, Hashem is the one that's going to decide whether you eat. It took him a little while to get the the the, uh, the guts to do it. Uh, but one day he decided that he's not going to go. He asked the boss, can I take off Shabbat? The boss rejected him again. So he just simply didn't show up. On Motzei Shabbat, he turned on his phone, had a bunch of messages. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? The next, he figured that when he goes back to work that uh, next day, Sunday, he's going to get fired. He walked into the office, into the thing, and he sat at his desk for a little bit before going on the field. And then the boss came to him and said, where were you yesterday? He said, I told you. I told you I can't work on Shabbat. He says, listen, don't ever do that again. I'm going to fire you. And he had, the, again, the courage to say, listen, it's not about you. It's, I'm not trying to go against you. I'm just saying I can't work on Shabbat. It's my religion. And the guy was n nasty to him, saying, listen, you do that again, I'm going to fire you. So the conversation ended that way. The next week, again, he didn't show up. Again, he didn't show up. The uh, boss called him a few more times, not as much as the week before. The next day, he said, you did it again. Listen, I'm, I'm, give, I'm, I'm giving you one last chance. You're a good guy. I like you. You do good work. But I'm going to fire you if you keep doing it. The next week, he did it again. Boss was on vacation. Didn't say nothing. He was on vacation. Next week, he did it again. He was on vacation again. The next week, when the boss was back, he came back. He did it again. No calls this time. What happened? Boss didn't say nothing anymore. After three months, he was already keeping Shabbat already for a few months. And uh, the boss didn't tell him anything anymore. And uh, after about three months, I believe, I think it was three months or five months, Hashem gave him some success in a few different things. A few customers wanted to do business with him. He ended up opening his own company. You know, maybe ended up making a lot more money for honoring the Shabbat. HaKadosh Baruch gave him a lot of promise. So that's the thing. If you're a Jew, there's no permission whatsoever for you to violate Shabbat, not by a minute, not by an hour, not by nothing. No permission. If you're not Jewish and you want to convert, then obviously you have to make uh, arrangements for you know uh, for you to uh, change somewhere down the road, but you don't have to quit your job now. You don't have to quit your job now because you're technically you're not obligated to keep Shabbat because uh, you're not Jewish. So, uh, But if you're a Jew, you have to, uh, you have to uh, keep Shabbat, 100%. 
Okay, we're almost done. Um, getting a little tired. Uh, let's see. Um, Hashem provides us with short uh, Amen. How do you do tshuva for a vasectomy? One got years ago before he became religious. Okay, so this is going to be a hard answer. Uh, this is a hard question. It's a hard answer. Somebody asked this question uh, recently. And we looked at countless sources, countless sources. The question is, how do you do tshuva if you're a Jew again? If you're a Jew, how do you do tshuva for vasectomy? Why? Because vasectomy is not allowed according to Judaism. Not allowed according to Judaism. Um, it's really not allowed for the goyim either. But if they did it already, they don't have to fix it. What about a Jew? If a Jewish man did vasectomy we looked at all the sources looking for a leniency answer is he has to undo it or divorce his wife he cannot be with his wife as long as he has a vasectomy if a man had a vasectomy he has to undo it no matter how much it costs the sooner the better it costs 10 15 20 thousand dollars to go undo it he has to undo it now even if the doctors tell him listen you're gonna do a uh, you're gonna do a surgery to fix the vasectomy but uh you know but the reality is that there's a very big chance that your wife won't be able to get pregnant anyway at least 50 percent chance you won't be able to get pregnant anyway because you know it's been already for a while so it may not work he still has to do it he still has to fix it and do whatever efforts he can to undo it uh there is no permission for him to live with a woman with a jewish woman if he has a vasectomy it's a sin every single time they're together Every single time they're together because a Jewish man is not allowed to have it. So it's a very big sin. It's a sin that right. It's a biblical sin. So uh, I know this is a hard answer for uh, some people that have done this because they didn't know, they weren't religious, but this is part of your tikkun. You have to fix it. You have to fix it and uh, you know, and have the surgery to fix it. Uh, this is this is the answer. Uh, can, maybe next week I'll talk about it a little bit more in detail we'll give you some more sources if you want but there's long and short of it because we're running out of time it's already two and a half hours long and short of it the tshuva for vasectomy for a man is that he has to undo it he has to undo it next question uh, the fact that you want to do tshuva is tshuva just continue to do tshuva. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Joel Bennett, that uh, you just concluded that someone wants to do tshuva, that's tshuva. It's, it's not really true. Wanting to do tshuva and doing tshuva are two different things. How do we know? Kadosh Baruch Hu says, Et esav saneti. Et esav, I hate him. Why does Kadosh Baruch Hu hate him? Why does Kadosh Baruch Hu hate him? Esav had a holy head. It was so His head was so holy, he was buried in the Marat HaMachpelah. It's right in the cave of the patriarchs with Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, and the matriarchs. Why? Because Esav, Esav, knew the entire Torah. And he wanted to do tshuva, but he didn't. Somebody that wants to do tshuva and doesn't do it, does not get the reward for doing it. It's Surely it's a good thing to want to do tshuva, but we should never imply that just wanting to do tshuva is already tshuva. It's a beginning of tshuva. Shuva is actually doing the act of fixing things. You know, if a uh, if somebody broke something, he has to fix it. Marla, uh, you could learn and pray during a day, Christmas, Christmas year. I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm sorry, Marla. I don't know what you're talking about. Christmas, we're Jews. We don't celebrate Christmas. Um, Joseph, I heard from heretical rabbis that abstract beliefs regarding the metaphysical. Example, what happens after death, the nature of punishment, are outside of the jurisdiction of practical halakha ruled upon by the Mishnah of old. That there is a distinction between injunctions issued by Sanhedrin involving physical obligations, which are binding, and what they may have incidentally subscribed to concerning how the spiritual... Realm. What's the question? How can one respond to such stupid claims? Okay, the response is... You, Joseph, made a mistake by listening to heretical rabbis. Because the Gemara in Masechet Moed Katan specifically says you're not allowed to listen to them at all. You're not allowed to listen to them, have conversations with them, nothing. 
not allowed to entertain them, not allowed them to have these thoughts in your head from their filth. No need to debate them, no need to respond to them. They're fools, they're heretics, and you should run away from them. That's how you respond to them. Sima, Kvod I am davening, I am a davening teacher for second grade girls, Baruch Hashem. When teaching them the Amidah, can they say it out loud regularly while learning and to ensure they say all the words clearly? Sima, 100% yes. When you're teaching the young Benot Israel, those holy girls that you have, Ashrech Ashrech El Kech, that you teach Am Israel, oh, it's so amazing. Thank you for watching my Shiu. Wow, such a person is watching our Shiu Ishtabach Shimon Ad. Wow, such an amazing person. You teach young girls to pray. Wow, what an amazing thing. So these young girls, of course, of course you want, to, you want them to uh, uh, say the right words and pronounce it. So of course, in the beginning, they have to say things out loud. Yes, 100%. They're little girls. They, uh, you want them to say it the right way. Yes, yes, yes. I know I said it five times, but I'm so excited you're watching my shoe and you're a person that teaches B'not Yisrael. You have no idea. The, 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 in the previous generations, the, the, the greatest sages in the world, the greatest sages in the world used to teach little kids. The Gdola Do, the Gdola Do would teach little babies, little kids. So imagine, uh, women that teach little kids, a big thing. As a story, the, um, the Gaomi Vilna, the Gaomi Vilna one time says that uh, he had a, a dream that uh, his uh, uh, his uh, kindergarten kindergarten teacher or a woman that used to change his diapers uh, came to him in his dream and told him, please pray for me, pray for me. And he owed her a lot of akaratato because she changed his diapers. You know, she was when he was a little kid, so he started praying for her. So after after a short period of time, she came back in his dream. He says. And she told him, please stop, stop praying for me, stop praying for me. He says, why? It's not good. She goes, no, every time you pray for me, you have so much merit. You're bringing me to such high levels in Gan Eden. I don't know what to do over here. There's so many righteous people. It's too high for me. Just enough, enough. You just, <laughs> enough. The only thing that says someone that helped you, a teacher that helped you when you were a little kid. Ooh, wah, ooh, wah. What a merit they have. So imagine one of your little girls going to be uh, married to uh, to to one of the Gdolei Adol. She's going to be the... Uh, the uh, Rav Kanievsky's wife, Bat Sheva. Bat Sheva was Kodesh Kodeshim. So imagine you, 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 one of your girls is going to become like Bat Sheva. Imagine like that. So, oh, Hashem, Shrechem, Shrechem. Yeah, definitely teach them the right words and uh, let them read it out loud until you know what they're saying. Sure. Uh, who are these people? Very bad people in this world. Um, I'm not sure what you're saying, Marla, but okay. Uh, Mike. Well, Rav, what is being accomplished on Rosh Chodesh before, uh, beyond uh, marking the time and the schedule? What is the deeper meaning of Rosh Chodesh? Because of the, the, the time, I have a couple of short daily chidush, uh, um, daily chidush uh, uh, videos or audios about Rosh Chodesh uh, that you should watch. Uh, in so many words, Rosh Chodesh is one of the most important mitzvot that we have in the Torah. We got it uh, from HaKadosh Baruch Hu because if it wasn't for time, we wouldn't know when to celebrate the holidays on the right level. And that's actually, Rosh Chodesh was one of the things that the Greeks, Simach Shimon Vezicham, wanted to cancel. They wanted us to cancel our celebration of Rosh Chodesh, which is Hanukkah. is coming up. One of the reasons we're celebrating Hanukkah is because we were able to continue celebrating Rosh Chodesh. Uh, because if it's not for Rosh Chodesh, we wouldn't know when to celebrate the holidays. So it's very, very important to know uh, about the Rosh Chodesh. You light a candle in Rosh Chodesh. You uh, you pray a, uh, uh, extra prayers in the uh, in your Amidah, the Alev Yavo. In the morning, you also uh, do a uh, uh, extra prayers in there. It's a little longer, a lot of Kedusha. So Rosh Chodesh is a big day. And also a big thing, Rosh Chodesh is the birthday celebration every month birthday celebration of the women Rosh Chodesh is the holiday of women every month they have a holiday it's Rosh Chodesh and Rosh Chodesh women are not supposed to uh, work in the house and things like that they should they uh, you know when you delight the candle you should take a break for a little while and not do any work 
if you want to order some kosher food or you want maybe the husband can cook for her or something like that it should be less work to allow the woman to enjoy Rosh Chodesh Rosh Chodesh is a very big deal for women a lot of zgulot and things like that um, Marla is continuing to curse oh so you're cursing me Marla shut your mouth no you shut your mouth you have nothing to do you're on your Facebook you're a keyboard warrior Ah, imagine being such a loser imagine imagine a person that has nothing to do in their life they decide to go on this thread where someone is trying to teach Torah just to curse me out and insult old Jews and so on imagine being such a lowly person like you I, I, honestly I think Gainom is actually worse it's not worse than that I think that your life is worse than Gainom because imagine you have a bunch of people learning Torah trying to do the word of Hashem and and the only thing you have in the world is insults about it imagine being such a lowly person what a what a lowly life that is what a miserable life that is I really feel bad for you to be such a lowly person that all you want is to insult Judaism because think about it this way none of the people that are watching this lecture right now are going to go to your page and to your uh i don't know reverence page and your pastor's page and tell them oh you guys are retards none of the people watching here are going to do it no jew in the world or anyone that loves the torah is going to go to to the to, to the christians and tell them you guys are retards no jew is going to do it why we have better things to do we're going to learn torah but only people like you lowly people like you come and try to interrupt with the jewish people what a miserable status that is for you you really should think about that you should really think about that i mean this is the first opportunity that i have to deal with people like you live usually i just see the comments after the fact and i don't have time to waste but it's really important to know that you're here for a reason it's a very very sad state to be in that all you have in the world when we're talking about god god the same god that created you and your filthy mouth the same god that created you and your filthy mouth we're talking about him we're trying to serve him all you have to do is insult us what a low status that is what a miserable life that is you really should think about that honestly you should think about it. it's a very sad state it's, it's 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 really you should really think about where where you are in the world maybe rethink your priorities what's important to you is making comments making fun of jews that important to you that's that's really that's going to make you happy is that that what you think what a sad scenario you're a sad sad person i pray for you because Hashem, maybe hashem will help you get you out of the genome you've built yourself oh, sad tanya i want to know if a non-jew wants to convert soon can she pray the shema or no if you are in the process of conversion meaning you have somebody that's directing you of what to do you have a uh, you're reading the books you're you're seriously taking conversion then you are allowed to pray all of the prayers and learn all of the Torah that a normal Jew would uh, because you have to do it for the sake of practice and you should know all of the prayers and and are considered in essence practice so if you miss it you don't have to repeat it if you make a mistake you don't have to be so upset at yourself it's all practice the real time the real prayers and everything else come the day of uh, after you convert but uh either way you should do it you should learn to pray you should learn uh to to do all the things that jews do if you're serious about conversion sure uh what is the location of shlomo amelech's kevil uh to my knowledge uh no it's something you could probably find on the uh on wikipedia if, if, uh, i'm pretty sure it's in Eretz israel uh, but uh i don't know exactly where i'm not i'm not uh, an expert on uh, places of uh of burial sorry uh, oh my dear mother god bless you kadosh baruch hu yivarech otach bekol mikol kol chayim arukim shlemim elayim torah mitzvot biyut chasadim nachad mailadim anechadim nachad mabal kadosh baruch hu yivarech otachem berefua shlema refuat nefesh refuat aguf let's see uh, link to some of our missing against books oh thank you very much yes farim sent us sometimes have them sometimes they have them yeah that, i buy some books from there too good place uh the partner can convert also 
Oh, if you're referring to two people that are converting, yeah. If 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 there's two people that are not Jewish, uh, and um, one of them wants to convert, the bed dean will only allow the uh, the conversion to happen if both people convert. You can't be one person converts and one person doesn't convert. If they're married, they're together. Both husband and wife have to convert. It can't be just a husband or just a wife. Uh, so yes, this may delay the process because perhaps they're not on the same page as you, but such is life. It's a, it's a difficult battle. It's a difficult test that you have, but you have to be patient and uh, supportive. And there's a shame. Eventually, they'll get there. Robert. Oh, good to hear from you, Robert. A, uh, how is it that honey is kosher since it comes from an insect, which is tame and not kosher? Uh, very good question. There is a Gemara that says, I would say me tame tame. Uh, something, that's impu- uh, something that's impure only produces impure things. Now, Chazal already talked about this in the Gemara, and uh, specifically this sugiya of how honey is kosher. And Chazal had uh, knowledge of this, that they said that the, that the honey does not actually come from the, uh, from the bee and doesn't even go through its digestive tract. It's actually a separate... Uh, a separate uh, canal, if you will, in the uh, uh, outside of the bee, if you will, that's not inside its digestive tract, where the bee just adds something to it to make it into honey. And later on, science uh, confirmed this, that literally honey does not go through the digestive tract of uh, uh, of the bee, and therefore it doesn't come from a bee, uh, and uh, that's why it's kosher. That's what it's kosher. Very good question. There's a whole tshuva on it in the Gemara. There's a tshuva on it online of why honey is kosher. It's a very uh, uh, interesting topic. Um, let's see. You guys have a lot of questions today, Baruch Hashem. Thank you, Brother Rav, everything you've done, changed my life. Uh, please donate. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. All right. Mois. Good to see you, Mois. Is me being single, not married, a result of my sins? Is there a rabbi or a book that can guide me to doing tshuva in a circumstance that I'm in, being alone? Is it me or is it just my mazal? The sins or no sins, only a kadosh baruch Hu knows what sins you have and what sins you don't have. What I would, uh, what I would suggest you do is focus on continuing to do tshuva every day. Focus on fixing your character traits. Focus on looking for the right woman the right way and not looking for the right woman the wrong way or the wrong woman the, the, the right way. You have to go through a shiduch system, go to a shadchanit or a shadchan, give them your shiduch resume, look for a nice religious girl to go date a few times and then get married. You know, you have to look at things, you have to do things the way that the Torah and its sages said, and not the way that Yetzirah says. And I think that if you do that, if you do tshuva, if you uh, or continue to do tshuva like you're doing, and you uh, even fix this particular item, then Bezat Hashem, you'll find you'll find yourself uh, your your kala, you know, exactly at the right time. Uh, Hashem is not giving you the kala that you have uh, that you want right now, perhaps because He wants you to do other things uh, that you haven't done yet. And uh, that's that's what you need to do. Elchanan. Uh, when learning, one may be more comfortable reading the chapter to understand it before going to commentary. Should one still stop at every line for commentary? Uh, I mean, it all depends on the person. I mean, the way I read for example, may not necessarily be the way that you read, but the way my brain works is that when I read a verse in the Torah, or I read a verse, in the, I read a line in the Gemara, or something like that, I need to know what it means uh, to at least the best of uh, my ability, which again means I have to go to the sages, go to Rashi, uh, at the very least, and then and, and see what does he say about this. Instead of just going to the next verse, uh, just so I can finish the page. And the reason why is because when I, my brain works in such a way that when I understand this verse and then I go to the next one, the next one also makes a lot more sense. Whereas if I just go through it and I just end up you know, understanding, let's say, a small percentage of it and then go back to the commentaries, 
it doesn't always give me that same fulfillment and understanding uh, as I do if I do it in steps. You know, because when you build a building, you know, first you build the foundation, then you build the first floor, then the second floor, then the third floor, and so on. You know, it's you can't build the third floor before you build the first floor. And that's what, in my opinion, for me, you know, just going through the verses and then going to the commentaries thereafter, many times it's like jumping around. It's like you're building, you know, the foundation, then you jump into the third floor, building, a, you know, a small little room there, and then going back to the, you're going back and forth. So from my brain, the way it works, I have to do everything in, 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 in uh, uh, you know, at least the best that I can in a, uh, um, in a way that uh, is in order. Takes a little longer, but uh, you know, we're not in a race. We're not in a race to finish. We're in a race to understand. So a lot of people are reading, reading fast, fast, just to get a lot of information. Now it's not really, a, you know, good idea. It's good as to understand what you're doing to the best of your ability. Now, if your brain works differently than mine, where you understand most of what you read and uh, the commentary is just like a topping on top of what you read, then, you know, your brain works that way, no problem. But for me, it doesn't work that way. So, again, it's a matter of preference, really. It's really a matter of preference. No necessarily an obligation to do it one way or the other. The main thing is to, uh, uh, to understand what you're reading and, uh, and, and do it on a daily basis. Uh, next... Uh, Jake, what did Rav Moshe Feinstein say about Thanksgiving? You're not allowed to make it kavua. You're not allowed to make it a uh, uh, you know annual uh, like the Goyim. Uh, I talked about it in the beginning of this year. You could just rewind uh, to the beginning and you'll see. Uh, or you could just watch this year that I have online um, that uh, is called um, Thanksgiving Uncensored or something like that. Just type in Thanksgiving on my page and you'll find that 30 minute or so uh, shiur about it. Sal, thank you, Rabbi. If I cannot make it uh, to work, to, uh, if I cannot make it work to get home in time, I will trust in Hashem to find another job. Amen. Amen. Sal. Chazaku Baruch. Amen. You'll succeed. You'll succeed. There's no doubt in my mind. You'll succeed. I'm so glad that we've had all the questions answered tonight. What a great shiur! How do we motivate ourselves to wake up for minyan with a smile when exhausted in the morning? Ah, uh, that's a that's the million dollar question, Jake. Uh, each person has different things, different things that motivate them. For mo for many people, the things that motivate them are things that are material. You know, where uh, you know we're motivated to go make a million dollars, so we show up to the appointment on time. We're motivated to go to a certain uh, trip, so where we wake up early to go uh, to uh, you know to, to the plane on time. Uh, material things, uh, you know, but the, the, the truth is, is that that's what Hashem measures us with, where he says, where he says that uh, when a, uh, when he judges a person, he judges him based on how he treats his mitzvot versus his other things. So if a person, uh, you know, is always on time to his flights, always on time to his, to his appointments, always on time to everything else that is, uh, you know, of this world, but he's never on time for Torah, that's a very big kitrug, a very big, a, uh, you know, a prosecution against him. Uh, if anything, he should uh, be early to everything or late to everything, not uh, treat Hashem's uh, mitzvot like it's a burden. So that's one thing. You should really understand that if you're on time to your flight, but you're not on time to go pray, if you're on, uh, excited to go to a meeting, but you're not excited to go meet Hashem every day, that's already putting you in a bad situation. Uh, and that should be motivation enough. The second thing is, is to know that all the money that you want to make and all the different material things you want to possess, you can't make it yourself. Hashem has to give it to you. So if anything, you should go meet Him more excitedly and more early and more uh, enthusiastically than anything else in the world because He's the only one that's going to help you succeed. And for that, it's a, a little bit of humility is what a person needs. And for that, you need to learn Musar on a regular basis. The more Musar you learn uh, and apply to your life, the more humble you become. The more humble you'll become, the more you'll fall in love with Hashem as a result of fearing Him. And the more you fear Him, and uh, you'll end up having a uh, much more desire uh, and excitement to go pray all the time, not just in the morning. It's not Hashem. 
Uh, okay, last question. Uh, Molly's, can I marry when the Mashiach comes? Uh, uh, when the Mashiach arrived already? Yeah, when the Mashiach comes. Uh, the Rambam writes that uh, we're only going to know what will be after the Mashiach comes when that actually happens. Meaning, everything that I would tell you, yes or no, is speculation. Speculation. Uh, we'll know for sure after he comes what really the the main thing is uh is to uh is to at least you know get to that point prepare neshamot for that point okay we'll answer one last question and then i'll ask you guys for a favor if you could do me a favor uh is it acceptable to pray in uh english uh while learning and slowly add hebrew over time pronunciations uh, hebrew is uh, difficult and slow absolutely it's acceptable that's that's what hashem wants hashem wants you to talk to him in a language that you understand uh you know to to make sure that you know who you're talking to and then little by little learn hebrew absolutely uh perfect you know many times people pray uh prayed in different uh, languages uh you know uh, i've seen uh uh sidurim with, with farsi with french with uh uh spanish all types of languages so there's many languages that uh, am Yisrael is pray to to pray to hashem sure ideally lechatchila it's hebrew but if a person doesn't know hebrew hashem still wants his prayer he still wants his prayer so surely you should pray in, your, in the language that you understand and little by little as you learn more hebrew you'll you'll pray more you'll pray more uh okay so i need you guys to um i need you guys to do me a favor we have a campaign that Rav Ephraim, God bless him, our dear Rav, started maybe two weeks ago or less, uh, which is uh, we need more merits in Am Yisrael. Now, uh, we decided that we have one of our tzaddikim, Rav Bar Kochva. He goes to Kever Achel for us and prays for people and so on. But we're going to do a special thing on Hanukkah. Hanukkah is when it's scheduled, you know, because of this coronavirus and so on. If Hashem decides it's going to be that day or a different day, but we're aiming for it to be on Hanukkah because Hanukkah is an auspicious time, an auspicious time for uh, for us to uh, uh, to ask for things from Hashem. It's a time of miracles. But to prepare ourselves for miracles, we have to increase our merits. So because of that, uh, if I started a campaign which uh, is to get 1,000 1,000 people new people to keep Shabbat to keep Shabbat so if you're you know if you're not keeping Shabbat currently as a Jew this is specifically for Jews if you're not keeping Shabbat as a Jew and uh, you uh, take on Shabbat give us your name give us your name we'll write you on a list and on Hanukkah, we're going to have a special prayer made for you at the Kotel Amaravi, at the Western Wall, by one of our tzaddikim. I pray for you, for all the brachot, for all the shefa, all the atzlacha, all the good things that you want. If you're not keeping Shabbat right now, you take Shabbat seriously now, you take it on, give us your name, sign up, and we'll add you to the list, because uh, we're going to do a special prayer for those people on, a, uh, on, um, on Hanukkah. So uh, already in the last few days, we got about 400 people already signed up, Baruch Hashem. Uh, so anyone that's a Jew that's not keeping Shabbat right now, please give me your name, and uh, Be'ezrat Hashem will, uh, uh, you know, will uh, will add you to the list. We'll pray for you and for your success and everything else on Hanukkah. If uh, you could actually write it on the thread here, if you uh, if you want, if you take on Shabbat as of now permanently, not just one time, permanently you take on Shabbat. If you already keep Shabbat, if you already keep Shabbat, you can still get yourself on that list by committing to get somebody else to keep Shabbat and doing it without giving up. Doing it without getting, you're promising to get at least one person to keep Shabbat. If you already keep Shabbat, but you want to be on this list, uh, then uh, you have to commit to getting one person to keep Shabbat, meaning as soon as possible, not like in your lifetime in a thousand years from now. You know, as soon as possible to get people to learn uh, to, to, to keep Shabbat. And not just a one-time Shabbat, and not like one of these uh, five-minute Shabbats. The whole Shabbat, all the time. You get somebody to keep Shabbat, we'll get you on that list as well, even if you already keep Shabbat. Uh, so these are the two things. We already have, Baruch Hashem, already 400 people or, uh, around that that have signed up in the last week, week and a half. We want to get to 1,000 people. 
thousand people, thousand new Baalei Tshuva to keep Shabbat. I think that's going to bring a lot of Nachat to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That's we get even more. But a thousand people, uh, I believe, is very attainable. I haven't even started. I'm only talking about it for the first time now. Anyone that wants to join it, Bechavod, please do. And uh, that's it, Rabotai. That's it. I, uh, we're already uh, almost three hours in. Uh, and I appreciate you guys. I uh, have enjoyed the shiul. You, uh, you watch with us. And Bezat Hashem, uh, we succeed. Morris, if you don't keep Shabbat currently, uh, then you, if you want to be on that list and you also want to go to Gan Eden, then uh, yalla, join the club. We'll, we'll, we'll add you to the thing. Now I understand why, uh, you know, the, one of the things that Hashem wants you to do, one of the things they want you to do, if Morris, if you want to join the list, then uh, give me your name, and Bezat Hashem, uh, meaning your... Uh, your name, uh, son of uh, your mom's name, and we'll add you to the list. We'll add you to the list. Um, how do you get somebody to keep Shabbat? <laughs> That's for you to do. That's for you to do. Uh, it's, uh, it's for you to do. As you, you can use my videos that I have about Shabbat, the Shabbat movies that we have. Uh, you, tell, you know, there's a million different ways you get people to Shabbat. Honestly, the biggest way to get people to keep Shabbat is to care. To care about them keeping Shabbat. To care about them keeping Shabbat. Is that Hashem you succeed? That's what she said. Okay, there's one last question. Somebody said, uh, can you get your parent out of Geno by con- by conferring merits on them with your mitzvot? There is a, uh, a lot of merit that you can bring to your parents or a loved one that has passed, depending on your level. Uh, but there's also a uh, opinion that you can't. Uh, point being is is that no one should rely on his kids or on her kids to bring them into heaven everyone should rely on themselves but anyone that's already left the world uh, then surely it would help them uh, if you would do a lot of good things in their name uh, more mitzvot more Torah more kiruv more uh, staka and so on and so forth for sure it will help them that we have uh, documented proof that that's the case but if somebody that's still alive should not rely on their kids to uh, to help them uh, go to heaven. Uh, so, oh, Baruch Hashem. So we have Moshe ben Dvora takes uh, takes Shabbat on himself. Chazaku Baruch. Kadosh Baruch Hu Yivarech Otcha B'Kol Mikol Kol. Chaim Arukim Shlemim Edeim Torah Mitzvot Minot Chasadim Nachat Zivug Agun Bezod Hashem. Now on Moshe, now you keep Shabbat. Shrecha. Anybody else that wants to keep Shabbat? From now on, let me know, and uh, Bezod Hashem will succeed. Uh, will succeed. Uh, Yaakov is saying, you feel like sending videos over and over, uh, and I don't know what happens on the other side. It makes it hard to do Kiruv. Uh, well, I talk to a camera, and I don't know if you guys are going to listen or not. And it's not that, the success is not our, uh, not in our hands. Only the effort is in our hands. Only the effort is in our hands. Success is not in our hands. We do effort. If you do effort, success is given to you from Hashem. Bezad Hashem, Hashem will continue giving us success to help Am Yisrael get closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. It'll give you success to continue bringing yourselves and the rest of Klal Yisrael closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And Bezad Hashem, we give Nachat. Nachat to HaKadosh Baruch Hu for all the wonderful things that He gives us. Chazakim Ubuchim. Hashem bless each and every one of you. Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Mevorach, and Bezat Hashem will talk in a few days. Kotuf. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen. Baruch Hashem, we've completed another year at Bezat Hashem. Rabbi Ephraim and I are very proud to announce some major milestones that we've achieved, Bezat Hashem, and with your help, our dear partners. Over 60 million minutes of our Torah has been watched over the last year. That's a million hours of Torah to help people do tshuva and get closer to Hashem. Over 300,000 CDs have been distributed around the world for free. We've also made over a thousand lectures between the two of us, as well as also with Rav Chaim being added to the roster. Over 60,000 regular viewers are watching our Torah right now across the board. Over 200,000 answers regarding halacha, family, Shlom Bayit, 
different topics on a regular basis being uh, given to people. Over 10,000 people have been helped, whether it's through food or different uh, financial issues. A thousand families of Torah scholars are being helped by Irgun Be'ezot Hashem. We've published and distributed over 5,000 halachic books, kuntresses, uh, newsletters, Musar books around the world. We are also currently helping over 130 families complete their conversion to Orthodox Judaism. Our TV channel continues to grow, our YouTube channel, our Facebook pages, our WhatsApp pages, everything continues to grow, Baruch Hashem. Thanks to Hashem and thanks to our dear partners. Be'ezot Hashem, much more next year. B'Shem Hashem Nasev and Atzliach, we're very excited to offer you the new Be'ezot Hashem app 3.0. It's a newer, faster app, full of Torah, lots of Kedusha by uh, the shiurim that we do, myself, Rav Ephraim, Rav Chaim, uh, where you'll have uh, also newer features where you're able to use the app uh, while you're using other applications on your phone. You'll be able to share the uh, the lectures directly from the app. You'll be able to donate online and support our cube and our Torah work that we're doing. And the most exciting feature is that you'll be able to actually ask questions directly on the app and get answers from the rabbis directly from the app. This is something unprecedented and Baruch Hashem will be able to offer it. Thank you again for all of your support. Check it out. Make sure you have the kosher Torah that uh, will re-energize your neshama each and every single day. Call to B'chavat L'cham.